Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanagh Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanagh. Guest today is Taylor Tate. Taylor, ready to be great today? Yeah, yeah. I'm having a good day. Yeah. So, Taylor, uh, thanks for doing this today. I really appreciate it. So, what so kind of softball question? What are like some of your hobbies and what do you do for fun? Um, well, um, so I'm a co founder of Black Muse, it's a virtual reality education resource center. Um, and basically, we teach students how to build applications, like metaverse applications in the metaverse. We also teach them how to monetize their virtual 3D assets um, and then provide advocacy training. So training on legal rights, intellectual property rights, trademarks, all of that. And so what do you do for fun? Um, well, I guess that's what I do for fun. What do you do for fun? I'm struggling with the whole um, work-life balance. Uh -huh. um, so I guess if I'm not so, doing- So for you, it's just work balance? It's, yes. Pretty, or, okay, watch anime, maybe. Watch yeah. a little anime and then sometimes go on nature walk. Okay. So um, it's amazing how many people are into anime, right? Yeah. It's like, it's a big community of anime people. Okay, but I'm, I have to say this because I don't want you- I am just getting into anime. Okay. So my partner, David, um, like business and romantic partner, like he's super into anime. Like when he was in high school, he was like the president of the anime club, you know, like I never. So you're saying Dave was a nerd. I don't, I don't know how he, what he would identify <laughs> with, but so yeah, I'm getting into it cause more cause he kind of knows. And so I'm just now getting into it. So what, what attracts people to anime so much? Like, I like, said, so like people, like, they, either they don't know about anime or they love anime, right? Yeah. And why, why do you, somebody, I said, why does it attract so many people? I don't know why it attracts people. I'm not, like, that immersed in the community um, yet, but I think maybe it's the, the storylines, the character development. I think if you watch, like, a regular movie or a show, you're not going to get the same type of character developments where, you know, we're really showing the friendship development and then as a friendship, you know, develops and the characters develop and, and they have, you know, their own personal growth narrative. And so maybe because it's how they, um, anime, yeah, uh, does like certain character development and, and showcases different relationships. Maybe that's why. And then also, I think a lot of people, they want to feel special, want to be like a hero. Maybe that's attractive to them. And then there's, you know, very common theme of like being a hero or anti-hero in anime. And so maybe just kind of thinking through those themes are attractive for people. I don't, I don't know. I just know why I like it. <laughs> and so does anime, does all of it come from Japan? Do you know? No, I don't think it, yeah, I don't think, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an expert on anime. I just got into it, so I don't, I, I can't make any claims. So why do you get into it for? Uh, cause like just throughout my life, I've always known people who were really into it. Yeah. And so I always wanted to watch it. Um, and then like I watched like an, like something on Netflix or something and I was like, okay, this is cool. You know, a few years ago during the pandemic and yeah, I just, I like it. Okay. Um. And so tell us about your educational background. My educational background? Well, uh, so for my undergraduate, I went to college at St. John's University. It's a small Catholic um, college. They're known for basketball. Um, and the then- one in New York City? Yes, yes, in Queens. Um, and then um, for my master's, I went to the University of Connecticut. Okay. Yeah. And you teach and you and you teach philosophy. Yes, yes, I teach philosophy. It's my love. It's, I feel like it's my purpose. I it's, yes. So, what drew you, drew you to philosophy? Say it again. What drew you like? What made you get interested in philosophy? Um. Well, I think for me, um, I think a lot of it had to do with my educational experience. So I was one of those students who um, were kind of slightly above average. Like, I, I didn't quite get into all the gifted classes um, or the AP classes, but maybe I got into, like, one or two when it comes to, like, testing into them. And so I always kind of felt this sense of um, having potential but not really sure if my potential can, like, really be something. That was always kind of, like, there. Um, and then along with that, there was a very uncomfortable experience during my educational uh, you know, um, experience where 
I was put in a lot of online on level classrooms with, you know, the black and brown students and then um, had kind of going through this sort of jarring, disconcerting experience of sometimes going into the AP classes and not feeling good enough. Everybody looks different from me. Not really sure I can do it, you know? Um, and so, you know, that was my high school, you know, middle school experience. And then, so by the time I went to college, I was kind of in like a certain type of, of mindset where um, not really sure who I was and like my capacities. And so uh, at St. John's University, they make you take these like three philosophy courses is three required philosophy courses that you is like mandated for you to take and so during my first philosophy course like everybody was like oh my god you're so amazing at this like I uh and I ended up like having like um creating these groups where we would like do philosophy outside of class and like go over the material outside of class and I would leave the groups and people were like oh my gosh you're great and um and so yeah it was one of the first times where people really like acknowledged me for something in that capacity of like saying okay you're really you know um and so I just kind of thought well okay this is what I'm gonna do and I and I just kind of kept going um and through that process I learned that people like Angela Davis, Huey P. Newton, um really influential black leaders uh they got their degree in philosophy and so I learned that if I wanted to be able to do something to create something to change things then maybe I could get the same sort of learning, the same sort of, you know, educational experiences as they did so that I would be equipped with all the skills necessary to build loving, sustainable communities in the way that they did with the Black Panther Party and, and all of that. Yeah, so, so I took an intro for the philosophy class at a junior college. So I have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. Of all the classes I've taken, that's the only, only thing I have left. I got rid of everything else from my philosophy, philosophy stuff. Mm -hmm. right? So um, do you consider yourself a philosopher? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. So what makes someone a good or even great philosopher? Ooh, this is really interesting because there have been times where people um, have questioned m m my philosophy and um, my um, decision to do philosophy given the interest that I have. Um, and what I learned through that process is that um, hmm, this is what I will say. That if a person is committed to the truth of trying to acquire the truth, of getting closer to the truth, of being aligned with reality, and they're committed to doing what is required. So maybe that's reading, being in community with people, talking with people about it, um, and really just going through the process, going through a certain journey of um, falling in love with wisdom, falling in love with truth, despite how hard that may be, despite certain painful truths that one may experience, um, and then using that process um, using the things that they learn throughout that journey to create something beautiful um, with others um, to create new knowledge. I think that that is, you know, I think that they're doing philosophy. Okay, here's a question for you. And I, I saw this somewhere a long time ago, right? And this meant you, you, you so this is a philosophy teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And on the question, the, for the final exam, the question was why? <laughs> well, just why? Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. And someone put, why not? What grade do you give that person? Well, I mean, it would depend on the rubric. You got to stick to the rubric when grading. Okay. I don't know, but um, I was. Because some people suppose like get brought like 10,000 wars, you know, a lot of <laughs> essays, all the kind of stuff, you know, and this guy just put why not. I think for my classes, if someone, if I asked why, and then they said why not, then I would say, well, why didn't you explain okay. yourself? Okay. They, they'll know, you know, not, okay, she, she's going to expect me to, to explain some things and not just say, why not? So uh, probably not the best grade, but the kind of insightful uh, answer. I love it. You know, quirky answer. That's, they may get some points for that. So what got you, what got you interested in actually teaching philosophy instead of like doing something else? Um, so at the University of Connecticut, we had this group. The graduate students. There's a full um in our um so okay, let me start off. Um, so there's a group created um a philosophy of education and community engagement group. 
And it was a collection of students, like undergraduate students, graduate students, and professors, but then also educators in the area. Um, and the group of us would get together and we would, the first day of class, um, we would talk about our educational experiences. And we learned a lot about just the kind of trauma that people experience in uh, American educational systems and educational systems elsewhere. Um, and then through that, we created different projects and we really worked to ensure that the school was a bridge between, um, or that we were a bridge between the university and the community. Um, and we, you know, did all sort of stuff and really worked to just think about how to create educational spaces where everyone is valuable um, and everyone has a sense of belonging. Um, and so through that process, I really developed a love for thinking about um, pedagogical, um, pedagogical strategies um, that foster love and belonging. So you said, uh, make sure everyone's valuable. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you make sure someone's valuable, right? How, is, like, is there a metric for that? Is it subjective? Like, how do you make sure, like, you know, Tom Brown at, you know, University of Texas is valuable? I think you can treat people like they're valuable, but that doesn't mean that people are going to receive it. And I think, you know, from our own personal experiences, we can kind of attest to that. You know, people can show love, but that doesn't mean that you can recognize that love, especially if you have like a different love language or if you're not even accustomed of receiving love at all. Um, and so I think that like, it's just really important that people in my classes that not that they necessarily are able to recognize it, but that they are able to receive it. Um, but in receiving it, I'm not a person, I'm not an educator that's going to be in the business of loving just in the way that I love. I am in the business of loving people in a way that makes them feel free. And so for me, the metric would be, do they feel free in this space? Do they maneuver this space? Do they navigate this space in a way that shows that they um, have the freedom to grow, that they have a freedom to um, to 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 explore um and they have the freedom to be different to 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 embody a different way of being a loving way of being if they can get to that place and maybe through the process um grow confidence in who they are and what they can do and their capacities and their ability to work with people then i will have known that i have done a good job in that but definitely i will say like the in terms of the metrics i don't think that we can say okay well um, the, the metric can be for people to feel that because for a lot of students, including myself, teachers, they teach things, you know, they say things, um, but we don't get it, get it certain lessons until after how powerful it is or how impactful it may be to our lives. And so maybe right there in that moment or during that class or during that course, maybe that student doesn't feel it or they don't receive it. But I think that there should be certain changes within the student certain ways of being, ways of knowing that they begin to embody as they go along the course. And even after the course, um, that can kind of signal that I've done my job and that as a class, because um, it's not just me who's supposed, you know, really has to do this work. It's as a class collectively um, that, that we've done that successfully. Yeah. Here's one for you. So, no, you know, people talk about safe places, right? This is a safe place for this and that, right? Yeah. So let's suppose... You're, you're teaching a class, you have 20 people, right? Mm -hmm. And 19 people will tell you, 19 students say, hey, I feel safe here. That's a great place. But one person says they don't feel safe. Like you change everything up based on that one person. You tell one person, hey, everyone else is safe. You need to, you know, maybe change your outlook. How does that work? Well, I think it's really interesting the whole thing about safe spaces to begin with. Uh, because when I was at you know, University of Connecticut, um, I remember entering like my first teaching experience. I was like, I'm we let's create a safe space together. Um, and mind you, these are like mostly like white male, <laughs> you know, student body, you know, pop. And they're like, no, I don't want to create a safe space, you know. <laughs> like, why do I have to do that? Um, that infringes on my freedom or whatever, you know. So um, I think that I've learned to be kind of weary about how I paint <laughs> the goals and really kind of see, okay, well, um, what do the students want to create based on their interests, based on where they've been, based on where they are? Um, what do they want to create? What can they create? What am I equipped to give them so that, you know, uh, to, to, to create things? And then I base that um, or I, I use that knowledge 
um, to figure out what the goal is. And so it may not be to create a safe space. Maybe the goal is, is to uh, connect to the material in a certain type or to connect to each other in a certain type of way. So when I was teaching um, at Ramsey um, Unit um, in Texas, um, it's a group of really amazing uh, men um, that I was teaching um, to, and I was teaching a philosophy of religion course, right? Um, I had this goal to create this space of uh, where they collaborated together, right? They, th through that process, um, they didn't really understand the goal. They didn't even understand why it was important to do in a philosophy class. But then throughout that process, they kind of, uh, they, they took ownership of it. Um, and they saw that based on their needs and where they were, that this was something that they can do. And they developed all sorts of skills in doing that. And so um, I would say that maybe creating a space of, uh, of, of where collaboration takes place, um, it could be a goal. But I don't necessarily know if that kind of space requires safety or a space that requires people to build certain things. If that requires the foundation for it to be safe. Um, because maybe it will require people to feel very uncomfortable um, or maybe it will require people to get used to experiencing fear or um, or or shame or even guilt. Um, and so I'm not sure if all the goals in educational spaces should be safety. But I would say like in regards to your particular question on safety, um, like if there's like one student who has some sort of issue um, I think that if there's one student who's saying that, guaranteed there's going to be other students who, you know, or at least the, the question invites other questions. Like, okay, well, what does safety mean? You know, what does that look like? Um, how have I experienced it? And how should I be experiencing it in this classroom? And through that process of the class collectively figuring that out together, we can come to an understanding of what our goal should be and what that can look like to us given the restrictions that we have. So I'm, I'm making this up, but you get the general idea. So mm -hmm. like since 1970, the cost of college has gone up like 20,000%. Wages have pretty much stayed the same, right? Mm -hmm. And students now have like, you know, six figure student loan debt, right? Having trouble finding a job. So from your point of view, what is the purpose of college, right? Is it to help someone find a job? Is it help like learn how to think? Is it like do something else? What is the purpose of college? And is college even useful anymore? Cause a lot of people like, they can like go be software developer, make hundreds of thousands. They can become a, you know, TikTok influencer, the case would be, you know. I mean, of course you're going to be like a actual doctor, medical doctor, lawyer, or want to go to Harvard MBA and you couldn't go to college, right? But is college even like, you know, for the cost even justifiable for most Americans now? Um, I think in order to answer that question, we would also have to ask, you know, other questions like what is the purpose of education and is the purpose of education so that people can get a job or is the purpose of education to engage in deep paideia like Cornel West talks about where there's this turning of the soul, there's this reflection of the soul, there's this process of genuinely grappling with hard, hard truth. Um, like, so yeah, like, I guess the question for me first would be, what is the purpose of education? Um, and then my question would be, well, then how can we, or, or, or who, who has to like live up to that purpose? So well, that, I mean, just like, okay, well, so insofar as we all have freedom, right? Um, and institutions have freedom to create whatever spaces that they want. Um, and insofar as it is good for them to do so, for them to create their own goals based on the needs of that community, um, then I would think about, okay, well, is it necessary for all people to adopt a certain um, understanding of what education should look like, what education is, and um, what education should be? Um, if it's not, given that, you know, maybe different educational institutions may have different needs and goals and values and may be seeking to, um, towards particular other ends, then I would say that when it comes to college, um, different educational institutions need to figure that out on their own. And so for me, that means that if you are, you know, Washington State University and you are partnering with different tribes um, and you're also have, you know, just considering your other, you know, 
populace and the demographics within that, right? That there's and, and the history of the people who reside there and the needs of the people who reside there, you're going to have a particular goal or end in mind that's going to be unique to you. Um, and I don't think that that goal will necessarily match all of the other colleges. I think it should be based on the needs of the time and the needs of the people who are there. And it should also be based on the capacities of the administration and the capacities of the, um, the, 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 the educators there to do that kind of work. Um, but definitely, I think, you know, when it comes to the educational models that we do have, they definitely need to be transformed. Um, and that's why with Black Muse, um, it's, you know, um, the, the, the company that I co-founded, the Virtual Reality Educational System, um, the, the, that's why we are really working to create um, an educational environment where people don't have to take out a whole bunch of loans in order to get an education so that they can work, you know, for 20, 30 years and then retire. Um, I, like we really are working to create um, an educational environment where um, if a student wants to get an education, it can be whatever it is that they need. It can be based on their needs. And so that they can take courses that are based on their needs um, and where they want to go. Um, and that they could pay that on the back end. And so one of the things that we're working on right now is to create um, certain STEM courses um, where the students, they pay on the back end. And so they can choose what courses they want to take. Um, they can choose, okay, I, maybe I want to take this course where we're spec I'm learning how to code or I'm learning how to do programming or I'm learning how to do curricular design. And then I can also take this other course learning how to, you know, with certain business skills or something like that, right? So that by the end of the, the time that I'm in the program, um, I will have um, something that I can create, maybe a business or something like that, that I will have had on my own. And I'll know how to, you know, function that business or whatever it is. And then I can pay for the education on the back end, meaning that whatever it is, um, however, you know, however much money that I made through my business, um, through my time in the educational space, um, I can use that to pay for my, my, my education. So how do you recommend someone to pick a college, right? Should it be based on their interests, location? Of course, affordability has to go with like, like, I suppose everything's kind of equal. And all the colleges that, you know, we'll just say they can go to any state college they want to, right? How should someone pick the college? Well, I would say, one, you should pick your college if you know what you're in. I mean, I, I, think, I mean, there's a few things. Like, so it, it's one, it should be interest. Um, so if you know what you're interested in, a but, lot of- Don't interest change? Like, don't people, like, go through 20,000 majors in college? They do. But if you know what you're interested in, like, generally- um, I think that it would be good if you kind of knew, okay, well, I want to go to a college that had already specializes in this kind of research because they will have certain resources there that can get me there. You know, if you know what you want to do, um, but say you don't know what you want to do, then I think you should definitely base on, base it, look at, base your choice off of how much funds that you have, um, and how much funds that are being provided to you. And so if you don't have that much funds, probably go to a junior college, maybe even think about, you know, a trade school or something like that. Uh, if you don't know what you want to do, that way you can really explore. Like HCC, that, like HCC is an amazing, amazing educational institution. And what, is, um, what does that stand for? Houston Community College. I teach, uh, it's one of the colleges that I teach at. And um, they have amazing resources for students. Um, and they provide like high quality education there. Um, but that's a college where, you know, it's not like a big four year university. Um, and so the students who go there, they're able to leave with a lot of different skills, um, but it's not costing as much as it would in a four year university and they're able to explore there. And so I would say, if you don't really know what you want to do, maybe go to a junior college. Um, because that's going to make it to where you're not going to have to pay, you know, you're, you're able to pay less. 
Um, and yeah, it's not going to be as expensive. And so your time exploring isn't going to be expensive. I wouldn't necessarily just start paying a lot up front if you don't know exactly, you know, the yeah, kind of so track you want to So many people make so mistakes. They go pay like 20000 a year for like, you know, like Duke University. They could easily with their junior college. Yeah, yeah. I think also there's this issue with like the SATs and all of that. I think a lot of students, they know they want to go to college, but they're not necessarily are, are some prepared to. Of that though? Huh? Are, are some colleges getting rid of the SAT and stuff like that? Yes, yes. Uh, but just for those who like still have that kind of, you know, structure in place or looking at the SATs or even they're looking at certain like letters that you have um, uh, so they, that they would write in order to get in. Whatever the application process is, they, a lot of times they ask students to do things that they're not equipped or prepared to do because maybe the school isn't spending that much time on uh, preparing or equipping students to do that. Maybe they're spending a lot of time on equipping or preparing students to, you know, learn something in science or something, you know, um, AP English, but it, that's not necessarily mapping onto whatever they need to do in order to be successful in their application or to produce a successful application. And so definitely, I think um, just, I, I think that if students were more prepared, there would be less of that because then they would have a better chance of getting scholarships because the application, based on their application, that that's going to decide how much scholarships or how much funding they get into. And so you can go to a college like Duke or, you know, whatever four-year college, you know, and maybe it's a little bit more pricey, but if you have scholarships, you know, that would make sense if you don't know what you want to do and you just want to explore. But if you don't have scholarships um, or if you only have limited scholarships, that's going to make your experience very stressful because then you're going to have to work and all of that. Yeah. And you, you also teach at Texas Southern University, right? Yes. So this is kind of like an all over the place question. So for those who don't know, can you explain what HBCU is? And then why would any, why should people go to HBCU? And I mean anyone, right? Because there's a TV show I watched a while ago where this white guy from Iowa went to Morehouse College, right? They did like a TV, like a little three series on it, right? Like, you know, how this white guy from Iowa, the whitest white guy from Morehouse College. Yeah. And it was just like, he just had wonderful experience. He wouldn't pay for nothing in the world. So I, and it's like, I'm going like most HBCUs, they, you know, recruit like one demographic, right? So why should anyone go to HBCUs? Um, I think in general, HBCUs now, like TSU, they um, are trying to be more diverse. Um, like, I know like in my student body or the students that were coming into my classes, um, it wasn't just by students, like there were like, you know, different people there. Um, it wasn't a lot, but I think because there's something that they're, they're doing now. Um, but yeah, I would say in terms of why go, oh, so, uh, why go to HBCU, like HBCU, like Texas Southern University, um, I would say it's, uh, this is, hmm. And, I was, and Texas Southern is downtown Houston? Yes, yes. And University of Houston also downtown Houston, right? Yes. So they're kind of like co-located together? or Yes, but University of Houston has different campuses. Okay, but they're kind of close together? Um, Yes, okay. they're very, yeah. They're like maybe about a 15-minute drive from each other. Um, I would say from, I, I think I'm just thinking about like why I love teaching at HBCU. Um, I, and for me, it's, it's very different from teaching, at, you know, UConn or teaching at um, more of a uh, primarily Hispanic based institution like HTC. And the differences lie in that, you know, if I want to talk about certain issues, um, the way that black people respond to those issues are going to be unique. And just having a space where they can generate ideas, where they can collaborate together, um, I think is just really, really important. And of course, it's not just Black people. There's so many different types of Black cultures, Black communities um, that are reflected in this space. So you have, you know, Africans, you have people from the Caribbean, you have people um, uh, who are a part of the Black elite, you have, you know, poor Black people all coming together and just really trying to get at the truth about things is really, really, really beautiful and special. Um, and so I think the campus itself, um, I think it, it reflects that, the, that uniqueness 
Um, and so I think um, students who want that kind of experience, I think that they would definitely enjoy it. And like for me, it's very different from teaching at a place or even learning at a place like the University of Connecticut or St. John's, um, where, you know, the University of Connecticut, that's a PWI, so predominantly white institution. And it was it's very difficult to both learn and teach in, in those kind of spaces and white dominated spaces where um, the way that people talk to each other, the rules of engagement uh, is very different. Um, there's so much that I did not know going in and before I went to the University of Connecticut about how to talk to my professors. What do professors think is good when it comes to um, communicate? And it doesn't even have to be like classroom management, anything like that. I'm not even going on that level, but just on the level of how do I express love? How do I express excitement? How do I connect to people? A lot of those things is different in white spaces and there are all sorts of rules around it. And if you don't know it and you kind of are tripping over stuff, getting stuff wrong and you don't even know why you're getting it wrong, it can be very confusing and daunting versus being in a space where it's kind of uh, the, the assumption is, is that you are valued and maybe aspects of your culture and your... Um, cultural cultures um communication strategies and, and uh ways of connecting are valid i think that's yeah it's just it's just very different yeah so on your on your bio it says uh specializing in philosophy of education spiritual empowerment and black feminism mm -hmm. what is spiritual empowerment well um i would say Okay, have you ever been in a class that it just felt like um, it made you feel like you could your 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 spirit couldn't breathe there, it couldn't be free there. You felt very, you know, restricted. Maybe because they have been in a, they kind of worked with the discipline and punish model, where you know if you did something wrong, you would be disciplined and punished, and you were really supposed to work to so you, model into about a the, certain the, type the of way. Catholic nuns going by, hitting you in the fingers, the rulers and stuff. It could be that, but it could be something as simple as you are a child and you have to sit in a room and shut up for hours on end and you can't really ask certain type of questions. You have to stick to this lesson plan that the teacher doesn't even necessarily like, you know, <laughs> and, and you just and, and you're literally being made to be a good worker in these spaces, you know, and that whole yeah. process. It can be very spiritually impoverishing. It could create a certain type of atmosphere within the space that is very that can be very restrictive and that can be very impoverishing. And so I would say like something that is spiritually impoverishing, um, it creates a situation where it's not nourishing. It is instead, you know, it's impoverishing and you feel that in the energy. You feel that in your own individual energy. And then you also feel that. Um, within the space. And so I, going back to the whole thing about HBCUs, right? Like there's certain ways of speaking that I'm used to or I'm communicating that I'm used to in certain spaces. Like, for example, you know, if I go to my grandma house and she's like, hey, baby, you know, come here, give grandma a hug, you know, like that, that kind of generates a certain type of energy or, or if, you, if um, you know, somebody says my name, you know, in a certain type of way, you know, that generates a certain type of or, or they they come to me and they they um try to and they're relating to me in a certain type, that generates a certain type of energy. Whereas if I'm in a different kind of space where people don't know how to pronounce my name um or people don't know how to love me how to be loyal to me how to even form solidarity with people who look like me you know that can create a different type of energy in that space for me but the space itself i mean it's creating a different type of energy because the space itself is generating a certain type of energy and i think a lot of times in those spaces it's generating a certain type of atmosphere that sucks um, certain people like dry of energy, but then it doesn't just leave them depleted. It 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 it, it uses that energy to um, and it exploits it 
and it uses it to advance itself. And so you have all types of black and brown people at universities in white dominated, you know, spaces at P W um yeah, PWIs who they literally uh, you know, they they're doing all this work. They're getting spiritually depleted from doing the kind of work that they're doing, but then also being spiritually depleted, their energy is being depleted because of the kind of environment and atmosphere that is generated in that kind of space. But the energy that they do have to produce the kind of work that they do, that's being exploited, you know? Um, and so, yeah, there's different ways in which in which people can be spiritually impoverished. But I think the whole, hopefully the educational example um, helps it make sense. Yeah, I know you mentioned like, you know, you know, like about like prep people to work, right? I know one criticism about education, I was like, is this a way to like make people work for 50 years, right? Like you, you take a college loan out, you get in debt, you get a bullshit job that you don't like, you know, and you just, it's like a vicious cycle. And then you, you're 65, you retire, you got to enjoy your life, but then your house broken down, you're like, you're in bad shape and you live like 12 more years, right? So like, I know it's one of criticism education, I've seen. That's yeah. Just really, it's more like, you know, like, um, I hate to say the word capitalistic mechanism. Like, yeah, that's what it yeah. is. So really get a drink. Which one do you want to do? Oh, a drink. Yeah. Oh, uh, can you surprise me? Like, what do you feel like? What do you feel like is me? Like, uh, what do you feel? Like? Uh, have you, have you tried any of these before? No, no. Okay. Um, we'll do this one. This is a good one. Buffalo okay. trace. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have some buffalo trees. Well, how was your educational experience? Um, so I wasn't the best student in high school. Like I, I'm a high school dropout. I mean, obviously I went back to college, back to high school. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm you know what's the word? I'm, I'm smarter than the average bear. You know, I'm 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 not I'm kind of like you. I'm not genius smart, but I get by. You know, and I think the big difference like the teachers you have, right? Like that's a difference, right? Like big thing too. Like yeah, it was, it was okay. I mean. Nothing to brag about, you know. I got really good once I got to college, right? Well, when I first graduated high school, I got to the University of Oklahoma. How? I still don't know, right? I had no business being in college. Once I failed out, then went back later. I was like a, like an all-A student, president of my university, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a, it's a good experience, you know. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. So when you were in high school, like, you were saying... When you were in high school, like it wasn't that much of a good experience. Can you say a little bit about why it wasn't? Because I was a knucklehead, like doing stupid shit, you know, like I was out drinking, you know, doing drugs, skipping school. And so the reason I, um, so back, so some couple of stories. So I was in sixth grade, right? I was, on, I went to Page Junior High in San Antonio, like only white kid there. Had a friend, Patrick Norman, right? Most sixth grade. One time me and him skipped school for 12 straight days. Oh, Charles Day. Day. Thinking of movie theaters, going to amusement parks, you know, that's time to go to a time, right? And like, man, like, we're like, man, this is ridiculous, right? We got to go back to school, right? So we went back to school, right? And of course, they were waiting for us, right? So guess what our punishment was? What? Three days suspension mm. at home. Oh, well, it was literally. <laughs> yeah. We're like, what? Yeah. And then, of course, I skipped like seventh day grade, but I still like made B's and C's, right? You know, it wasn't hard. In the 10th grade, they changed a the rule where you can only miss 10 days of school during the whole semester, right? And so I think in February, I, I, I missed like the 10th day in February, right? They said, hey, you're not getting any credit from school. i like, so you want me to go to school every day and get no credit? Bump that, you know? So I skipped, dropped out for that year, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I had to do it, I would have stayed in and got kind of smarter, right? But I dropped out. Well, it's kind of like, you know, bad as a fact, I missed a half semester of school. And still graduate on time, right? Which is like, you know, yeah. It's like, yeah. Well, can you say, like, okay, what was the school doing that made it to where being outside of the school was better than being inside of the school? I mean, it, it was just, I won't say born, you know, but it's like all the clicks, you know, with a pretty big school, you know, the in crowd, out crowd. Um, I was like 15, 16, going to clubs, you know, doing like stuff I shouldn't be doing, like staying all night, like, like, yeah, it was like, yeah, short-term attitude and stuff. It's, this wasn't fun, you know. It's like, it was to an extent, you know, but it's just the teacher was so boring. You teach, like, like biology. Like, I don't want to cut on a frog. Like, what is this mess, you know? Or, like, yeah. Right. And then, like, you know, the, the class, like, 30, 40 people, you know, like, so you in the back just messing around, you know. Right. You know, 
And luckily back then there's no cell phones, you know, so shit, we'd have been on the phones all day long in the back, you know? So yeah, it's just, yeah, I really like flourished as a student in college, you know? But it sounds like the classroom size was an issue for you. And then also the pedagogical strategies of the teacher that they were in creating like a good, exciting yeah. energy within that space. And so it created a situation where you would want to be outside. Yeah. But if perhaps do you think that they were able to cultivate um, an exciting atmosphere, do you think that maybe that would have encouraged you to go and attend more? Or is it a, was it a situation where because of where you were at mentally, you're like, okay, I just want to go to clubs. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I was in the streets. Yeah. There was, okay. Yeah. That was okay. In the street, yeah. Cause I, I, I think that's one of the things that, you know, I think about a lot of, you know, um, if students have an exciting atmosphere, you know, because of the, the teacher or the educational environment is really exciting. Um, and then also is, you know, the educational model allows for students to understand the connection between what they're doing. So they're not just doing some weird shit with frogs, but yeah. they're understanding the connection to, um, to the, the, the just to, to science, to how that, why this matters, what the purpose of this is like, would they, would classes be different or is it, you know, a situation where, you know, people would generally kind of still do the same. I mean, think about it, like, you know, I, I could go to class, and listen to Charlie Brown's teacher talk, right? Blah, blah, wah, wah, wah. Or stay out all night, go to the rendezvous at 15, 16 years old, get served drinks, you know, have a good time, right? Like, back then was an easy decision. You know, of course, the wrong decision, of course, you know, but I'm sure many kids do the same thing, you know, unfortunately, you know. Yeah. Well, okay. If, okay, so say that you're not, the choice isn't going to class and having, you know, well, well I listen for, or going out and having fun. What if the choice is, you know, we go to class and we do cool ass experiments together and the teacher isn't even lecturing that much, but we just like do cool shit. Maybe so, but yeah. You still, you still, you're like, no, that's like, where I mean, you're. that made a difference, but no, no, like, you know, you have a lot of people like they'll say, I remember my teacher from ninth or 10th grade. I remember none of my teachers from high school. I remember them from college, you know. I remember one from elementary school, one from junior high, but none from college. What did I wrote them from high school, I mean. What did this, the teachers in college do different? That's more like, I don't want to, like, more collaborative, I guess, you know, like, more. I guess another thing, too, like, in high school, it's like, you know, Charlie Brown, lecture, lecture, lecture. We're in college, of course, they lecture, but every once in a while, they like, hey, you know, Jason, what do you think about this? You know, that kind of stuff, you know. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just a different experience. It's, I don't know. So are, would you say if you had a similar experience in college, that oh in high school that you did in college like say you had this same so another difference too like in high school like you really don't see the future right you're like you know you're in your little bubble you know you're a group of friends there's nothing i grew up in odessa texas so i, I moved to odessa texas for seventh grade year so there's nothing i said odessa texas maybe Midland, texas right maybe dallas but there's no california what's that you know europe what's that right so you're in this little bubble right where you go to college like oh shit like i got to do good in college to get a good job so i can do the thing i want to do right well, it sounds like we just need to make high school is more like college. Maybe. Or maybe not. I don't know. Not plus, you know, it's just like different demographics, like, you know, like economic different demographics. The age you know. group yeah. itself is, yeah. Because at that time, that's like, you know, the time where you start questioning things and what you want to explore. And so it makes sense. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned um, Cornell West, right? Mm-hmm. He's like pretty much like a liberal philosopher, right? Um, yeah, he's amazing, you know, black philosopher. I think he identifies with and so, um, pragmatism. You know, you know who Thomas, I think his name is Thomas Sowell? Mm -mm. No. He's like a conservative black philosopher? No. No, okay. I was going to have you compare the two. Okay. But uh, go with Connor West. Like, he's like pretty well known, right? Yeah. Is he like the, pre, would be known as like the pre preeminent black philosopher these days or the, like, well, I think yeah, now that he's like running or possibly running for the presidential election, definitely, you he know, is? yeah. So he's run as a Democrat, a progressive. I'm not sure. Left I'm not sure. I feel like he's probably gonna. I, I don't know. About him. I, I've seen like clips and like videos and stuff, and I've seen he's like done interviews. 
And so I think maybe kind of like running the kind of Bernie Sanders line kind of, you know, he helps Bernie. Yeah. I remember when I was uh, in college, I would do the, uh, you know, knocking on doors for Bernie and all of that. And I remember at one of the events, Cornell West showed up and okay. he was like really, really like, you know, supporting yeah. Bernie. Like so. the thing with Bernie, like you have to, so like, I, I don't agree with a lot of the politics, but you have to admit, admire, like he's like been, like stayed the course since the 1821s, right? Like he's been right. long for a while, right? 1820, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's been a while, long for a while, right? And yeah. He has the same thing over and over again. Of course, the criticism about it could be like, you've been here all the time. What have you really done to progress your cause, right? Yeah. Yeah, but the thing with Bernie is like he basically, I mean, not, I mean, we're gonna talk politics now. I'm, and he, to me, he got cheated out by the Democrat Party, right? Like, like they screwed him over with Hillary Clinton, you know, to the him around this last time, you know, like, but they, I don't know, right? And then with de like Democrats now, I know, like, um, of course, President Biden, he's the president, he has like kind of an advantage, like, but like the Democrat Party, they're not even doing like debates or anything, right? Which is kind of seems like unfair, right? But then again, I don't really know who's running against him. I think the guy named Robert Kennedy's running against him, you know. He's like the grandson of Robert Kennedy or whatever, you know. So he's probably not really a channel, but at least like, you know, have a debate, right? Right. But of course, you know, they're of course they're scared, right? Yeah. You know, like this 85-year-old man, how old he is like, you know, all the stuff he does, right? Miss miss mumbles or like and how many times he's like turned, gave a speech, turned to the left, right, shook someone's hands, and no one there, right? And this is the stuff he does, right? But I don't know. But yeah, I didn't hear about Cornell West running. I think he should run, though. I think it'd be good. Of course, it'd be tough for him to win because, like, he's, like, I won't say extreme views, you know, but like, he's kind of far left, you know. I think, like, he's done so much work um, going on, like, Fox News, uh, you know, CNN over the years. And he you know creates. I, I love when, like, I love when, like, when he goes on Fox News. Like, yeah. I don't want to say, like, enemy territory. It's kind of enemy territory, right? To me, like, you know, like, like you have like liberals going like I think MSNBC conservatives going on Fox News. Okay, fine and dandy. You want to impress someone, go like quote unquote enemy territory, right? Do like Connor West go to Fox News and defend your views, right? He does a great job doing, you know. And I think he does. I love it because he doesn't just defend his views. He like creates this. He's like you know he he will literally call them brother sister, and he creates that kind of atmosphere where it is grounded in love. And a lot of what he says, you know, he he speaks his truth. But he's always grounded in love with that and always has this sense that I'm not just talking to uh, my enemy. But even if I, you are my enemy, like I'm supposed to love my enemy, you know, because he has that sort of Christian um, demand to, 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 to you know, um, to have him be like, you know, to love his enemies. And so he always on those shows, um, he's always doing that, always like showing love and compassion and building bridges with people. And so I think that if he were to do it maybe i'm wrong maybe he's not but um gonna try and be president or run for president but if he were to do it i'm hoping that people who've seen him over the years form these relationships try and build bridges with people like that they would be like okay you know maybe he can help build bridges because that's something that has always been a call for action in politics like can this president um, get the Democrats and the Republicans together so that they can create meaningful, lasting change together. And I think that someone like Cornell West, who's grounded in the kind of ethos that he's in, he's grounded in, I think that he would, you know, be able to do that. But also, I think, like, there's so many different people who could do it, but for whatever reason, we get these, like, really bad pickings. I'm not sure what's happening. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. I say all the time, like, as a country, we got to do better than Biden and Trump, right? I mean, I mean, of course, they say, like, you need, the country, a country gets the leadership they deserve, so maybe some of it, but then they, like, you have to think both the Democrat and Republican Party have failed us, right? Like, has to be better candidates out there somewhere, right? Right. I mean, I yeah. mean, sometimes, like, like, this pick up some random dude off the street, right? Out, out of McDonald's, they'd be president, right? Stacey Abrams, somebody like that who we've seen. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good choice out there. Of course, this, you know, the system set up like to have the people in power on power, I guess, right? Right. And of course, like people on the, we'll say the right, they can't understand why, how do, how are they picking Biden again? That's impossible. People on the left, like, how are you picking Trump again? That's impossible, right? Yeah. Because it's like this, they're going to like this obstruction, right? And then those people like, you know, Tulsi Gabbard up from Hawaii, you know, she can't get any love. The people on the Republican side, you know, it's, it's, it's just, I don't know, disappointing. Yeah. I definitely feel like that, like, the way that the Democrats and Republicans are pitted against each other keeps us from having nuanced 
conversations that can actually like help us get out of certain situations that we're in and help us to build a new um because this whole thing about okay well trump or, you know that isn't even to me that doesn't even matter you know what are the issues and how can we solve them like that's hey, like what we i'm gonna stop you for a minute you're like you're moving the shit out of that chair oh <laughs> sorry yeah no worry you're like <laughs> sorry <laughs> no worry um so so next so we're talking about Connor West. So next, also in your bio, it says, uh, um, best life is the philosophy of education, spiritual empowerment, and black feminism. Mm -hmm. Like, break down, like, what's feminism? What's black feminism? Is it different from, like, Hispanic feminism? Is feminism feminism? And is feminism even, like, uh, worthy? Feminism worthy feminism. Is there even a worthy goal for, for women now? There's so much. There's so many questions in that. Um... So feminism, um, or I think a lot of different feminists have different understandings of what it is and also different understandings of what gender is. It's one of the huge problems in the uh, field is like coming to an understanding of its actual identity. Um, for example, when you think about, or I guess to, to kind of like break it down, when you think about gender itself, a lot of people disagree about what it even is gender? What does it mean to be a woman? So people have conversations about getting proper representation for women, but they don't even know like what they mean by women. Some people mean to include trans women. Other people just mean cis women. Um, when they're talking about cis women, some people, they cisgendered women, maybe they want to talk about um, women who have wombs. Uh, other people want to talk about women who have wombs and can produce children, you know, um, but there's not really a consensus about, okay, well, what does it mean to be a woman? Are we going to say it's a person with a womb and an ovary? Are we going to say it's a person who has these particular preferences, you know, and so, so that we can kind of get on the same page about what does it mean to have proper representation for women? And it's the same thing on the side when we talk about um, non-binary folks, um, men, you know, there's this confusion about what these titles, what these categories, what these identity actually mean. And so because of that, there's a confusion about, or people, I wouldn't even say necessarily confusion, but people aren't on the same page about what feminism actually is, because feminism is supposed to be about gender and sex. But if people can't get on the same page about what gender or sex is, um, then there's going to be disagreements about what the actual field is who, about. Who decides or who gets to decide or who should decide what is gender and sex? Like who gets to decide what a man is, what a woman is, what all these pronouns are? Who, who's supposed to, who gets to decide that some, a lot, some professor, some college, some nonprofit executive director, some, someone has the most social media follower, who gets to decide that? I think that question is a really great question because a lot of people would say, well, it's not this group, <laughs> you know, and they have it wrong. Yeah, yeah. So, they should don't, don't agree with them. Right. And so that's why it's very difficult to define what feminism is or what gender is, is because there isn't just this one person who has, you know, the um, answer about what, you know, gender is. And so what feminism or, you know, um, yeah, so what feminism is. Um, or what sexuality, what kind of sexual, um, sexual issues we need to be addressing. And so what, um, you know, what feminism is. And so because of that, I would say that there are a lot of different types of feminist collectives. That's why you have, you know, um, um, decolonialist feminists, you have black feminists, you have um, TERFs, you have all of these different types of feminist collectives. Some of them are focused on equality. Some of them are focused on representation. Some of them are focused on um, decolonialism. They all have different goals and they all have different understandings of what gender and sexuality is and the problems around it and how to solve the problems around it. And even in those collectives, there's certain tensions around certain things. So, so yeah, there's not one. So obviously you're not the spokesperson for fem all fem feminism or all feminists, right? But have the goals of feminism been met or there's still like things that feminists have to like achieve? Well, in regards to the goals, different groups and collectives have different goals. And so um, I think it would depend on the group itself and what their, their, their end goal is. And so 
um, if the goal is to have equality with white men property owners, we can look at the statistics and we can say, hey, there's been a lot of progress when it comes to this. There have been a lot of women who are already kind of at the ceiling, you know, who have been able to raise up um, past the ceiling and they've been able to gain representation in media. Um, and so for them, they would say, okay, well, we've made a lot of progress, but there are certain things that can still be done. Other people, they may look at the same thing because maybe they're in a different kind of collective. Say you have an abolitionist feminist who will see that and they will say, well, okay, um, white women property owners or, you know, uh, sprinkle with a few Latinas and um, a, few, a few black women um, being able to pass the ceiling. That's not actual equality or representation in order to experience gen genuine freedom or representation or equality or any of these good ends or ends that we may call as good. You would need to have poor women, poor cis um, gender and trans women um, 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 and trans men um, and men in prison, um, men who have experienced issues with immigration. All of these different groups being able to experience a certain type of freedom when it comes to their gender and when it comes to their sexuality. And, you know, you may have another group who, um, you know, may look at other things and they may say, okay, well, uh, maybe a decolonialist feminist. They may say, okay, well, until we have challenged or not just challenge, but completely build a new when it comes to thinking about gender. So until we have surpassed the way that gender, we conceptualize gender because of the colonial matrix, until we have surpassed that, we won't be able to really be able to say that we've achieved any genuine feminist goals. And so because you have these different feminist collectives, there's not just one understanding of what it means to be a feminist. Um, we have to look at the different collectives and see, okay, well, what are their different feminist goals? And then see, okay, well, have they been able to achieve that? Or what success have they been able to gain? When did like, the feminism movement actually start? You have to know. So I would say that uh, when you, I mean, it, like, what? Okay, the term feminist, we kind of were talking about that, you know, around the 60s and 70s, but people have been doing feminist work way before people started to be called feminist. I mean, wasn't, what's her name, Susan B. Anthony, who like did the voter suffrage for women? She would be a feminist, right? Right. But right. why say that she began it when there were Black women in this country speaking about it, going on, you know, different uh, speaking engagements, talking about issues when it comes to gender, when there were blues women who were in their songs talking about issues around gender and sexuality, doing it way before, you know, she did it in their artwork, in the work that they were producing, right? Maybe they didn't call themselves feminists, but they were doing that kind of work. Why say that Susan B. Anthony or these other, you know, white women created it? And even before that, before America invented it, we've had issues around gender and sexuality. And so let's look at those people, women, trans, all of those people who have focused on issues around gender and sexuality okay. and talk about so, them. So pick one of those people, right? From Pick whoever you want to pick, right? Okay. And, and bring them today, today, right? Okay. They say... Like we like feminists, females have made like great progress. So they say y'all females are still way behind. What do you think? Would they say we made like enough, you know, improvements in our lives? Like, what do you think they would say? I really, I think it goes back to like, what are their angles? You know, we can't just make these sort of grave general, uh, uh, you know, uh, so these like big generalizations about feminism, um, without looking at reality and that's why i love philosophy so much because we have to look at reality okay and if we're looking at reality we can't just make a generalization about every group or everybody in the group we have to look at the nuances we have to be concrete about things and be like okay well at the point where we're aligned with reality we're connected to reality of what happened and we see that there are different groups then why even talk about feminism as if it's just this one thing and everybody has this one understanding of it and this one angle and this one understanding of what success means? 
And so you would have to then look at, okay, well, if we're talking about Anna Julia Cooper, right, um, then we, we would have to say, okay, well, what did Anna Julia Cooper say about Black women and how Black women needed to, uh, and what freedom meant for Black women, you know, and how um, that kind of freedom would call for other groups of women, maybe white women to experience other types of freedom or, uh, you know, um, I, I think we would have to look at her particular wisdom, set of wisdom, and then see, okay, well, have we been able to do that? We can't just say, okay, well, this is just, you know, what everybody thinks, or this is just what will count as success. So from your point of view, what's the future of feminism or black feminism? Okay. So you want to focus on black feminism? <laughs> what do you want to do? Feminism, black feminism, whatever you want to go on. I think that the future depends on each generation. You know, I'm following Prince Fanon on this. Each generation has a has a goal. Each generation has a mission that um, they're supposed to fulfill because of the needs that are um, that they're dealing with at that particular time. And so um, we have to look at the needs that the particular individuals of that time or of this time are experiencing. And then we have to see, okay, well, um, like, what does it look like for that to be met? What is it? And what the, what does the horizons look like? Because of course, being able to address a particular need, being able to overcome a particular obstacle is great, but then can you build something anew? And what does that look like? How do we do that? That's a completely different conversation. And so I think that each generation needs to be able to do this work. And this is why you have philosophers like Angela Davis saying, you know, like that freedom is this continuous struggle. It doesn't end. It doesn't stop. You know, each generation is going to have particular problems and needs that it needs to address. And that isn't a bad thing. It's just love. Like, you know, I'm sure in all of our relationships, there are going to be different things that come up. But just because there's a problem, just because there's certain tension doesn't mean, oh, shit, you know, like, you know, now I have to deal with this. It's just, I'm just finding new love games, new ways to love people better. And we're just going to continue to try and love people in the best way that we can. And it doesn't stop and it doesn't end because love is inland. Here's a question for you. What's, what's more powerful, love or hate? Well, definitely love. <laughs> but why? If you think about it. Yeah. Why? Um, because isn't hate more powerful, like short term? It gives more focus, more like, you know, energy. Of course, it destroys you over the long run. I mean, love it in, in, in the long run, right? But like, what's, what's the difference, you think? I think that hmm, when I think about power, power is to be able to do something, right? And so um, if we're thinking about, is this or that going to allow people to do certain things? Or what is this or that allow people to do? We would see that when it comes to hate, it allows people to do be powerful in the sense that they're able to create destructive things. Or they just kind of keep things the same and allow things to continue to be destructive. But when it comes to love, love caused people to produce something different. It allows people to tap into their power for creativity and be innovative and be creative and produce different kinds of things. It doesn't just do the same old thing, follow the same old formula that hate causes us to follow. And so love being that it allows people to create something new and tap into creativity, it actually is more powerful because it's actually like literally embodying what it means to be powerful, um, to, to, to exhibit power, which means, it, you know, it, it, which is to do things. It allows people to do way much more than hate does because it, it, it calls for people to um, be creative in a certain type of way. All right, change the subjects. Okay. Talk about your nature hiking. Talk about my nature What hiking. do you like about nature hiking? Where, what, what kind of hikes have you done so far? So, you know, I'm new to Washington. I'm from Houston. Um, and so I have so many nature hikes in downtown Houston, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, but there's still like some nice like places to yeah. go. Um, in but, Houston. but not like up here though. 
I don't hate on Houston. I don't, I don't, I'm, 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 I'm kind of I'm hesitant about the, you know, I'm really connected to the land in Texas. And so that's why I'm kind of like, uh, and, and when I did get here, it was difficult for me mm-hmm. because, you know, the trees were so big and it just creates this different kind of atmosphere, different type of energy, like, you know? Like people don't realize how many trees are up here, right? Yeah. There's a fucking boatload of trees. Like, yeah. you have no idea, like, even if you're here living, you don't realize how many trees are here until you're like, you go outside and like, oh shit, that's a lot of trees. Yeah. Yes. And so, and they're so, and they feel, you feel that, like you feel the energy emitting from them. They call you to invite you to do and be and different. And so that kind of like put me back a little bit when I got here um, and kind of scared me a bit, honestly, because I felt like it, it was so foreign. And so, um, I mean, I would go on a few different nature walks when I first got here to different areas. You know, of course I went to, um, what is the, it's like the little volcano everybody goes to. Mount Rainier. Uh, yeah, Mount Rainier. Um, and so I went there. That was beautiful. But I think I'm just now, I've been here for a few months, starting to really yeah. get into a place where. So there's a hiking you do. I can't remember what it is. I'll send it to you. I, I got to find it. But there's a place you can actually, and it's, it's kind of a hard hike, right? It's like kind of steep. It, it's like, it takes a long time. I think it's like, I don't know how far it's up. But you, you get up there and you actually you can actually see a glacier. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's fucking pretty cool, right? To see this actual glacier, right? Yeah. It's pretty nice, yeah. Do are you a spiritual person? Yeah, sort of kinda, you know. Okay. Yeah. Cause I know like some people say, you know, the high like when you go really up high, you can connect to God more or yeah. certain spiritual entities more. Yeah, it's, it definitely it's definitely something to like, you know, see when like mountain views and nature and like clouds and stuff. It's 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 something different about it, right? It's like yeah, it's 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 it's, it's ethereal. Experience. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. How often do you go hiking? Uh, well, you know, I told you at the beginning, I'm just been working. Work, work, work. Yes. But I'm, I'm kind of scared about this winter. You know, people keep telling Is me. Is your first winter? Here? Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I got to get some time in. Yeah. We'll talk about it after this, right? It, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's bad. <laughs> I mean, like, it's and some people like do different things you're like but like basically think about it right once the time changes the sun is only up for like we'll say eight 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 a.m to four p.m right but it's always cloudy right I mean, you, you're gonna go like a couple months out the sun right so you got to take your vitamin d maybe get some fake lights and stuff you know go to texas for a couple of weeks you know <laughs> yeah it, it can get pretty bad like this last i've been sitting like 15 years last summer like it hit me really bad last year like this really well actually this year like, it hit me bad right like oh shit like, yeah it was, it was bad right What's it called? Seasonal something depression? That's, yeah. That's the yeah. thing here. Yeah. Yeah. It's just be ready for it. But just take vitamin D, go to Texas a couple of times, you know, maybe get some fake sunlight. Yeah. But and of course, nothing about the rain here. Like people say it rains a lot. It really doesn't rain a lot. It's just like my people t- I tell people like if I close in Houston, it might rain an inch an hour because of the thunderstorm, right? Here it'll take two weeks to do the same inch. But it's just that constant pitter patter, right? Mm. Know, just that drizzle, you know. But like in Texas, like, if we'll say, Houston, if it rains, you're not doing nothing. You ain't going outside, right? Here, like, people still go outside, do stuff, you know, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's a difference, right? Yeah. I'm like, how, how I need to find out, like, how do people go out and, like, maintain, a, like, their hair? <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, so, how do you take care of yourself? Uh, take care of myself? Yeah. Um, well, the way that I kn- I've been taught, um, I'm a religious person. Um, Christian believe in God and the way that God um has taught me to take care of myself is to go wake up early in the morning, uh, take a nature walk, be present, be open to God, um, and just kind of ask God, you know, where do you what do you want me to do, you know, in this day today? Um, and then just be grounded that day, keep continuing to check in, you know to God, you know, who for me is this vast, inexhaustible, infinite source of energy and wisdom and love. And so to keep connecting with God throughout the day um, and take care of myself in that way and also um, treat my body like a temple in the sense of like really honoring my body. Um, And that means- Besides putting bourbon inside of it. I mean, bourbon <laughs> isn't necessarily bad. Like, yeah, I'm just joking. that could be a way of honoring your body. Yeah. For me, honoring my body isn't just eating healthy foods. It's like 
giving my body what it wants and that can be bourbon and that can be salad yeah depending on what my body needs yeah because pleasure is good for the body you know a lot of people think god doesn't want you to experience pleasure but i think you know based on just my reason (laughs) reasoning i think that we should experience pleasure if if god didn't want us to have pleasure why would he put like pleasures like nerves or whatever you want to call it right in parts of our body, right? right exactly so since you brought up god this would be a good last question right so um there's a guy um there's a comedian named uh what's his name um some comedian right? he's an atheist right mm-hmm. i can't think of his name right he's a real famous comedian and he was talking about you know like why do you don't believe in god and he said like and i'm making this up again like the post looks like looks like all these gods are on the world right mm-hmm he said, well, like there's 300 gods, you know, you only, you only believe in one of them. I believe in one less than you. Right. Uh huh. So like, does believing in something make, make, make it true? Like if you like believe in Santa Claus, is Santa Claus true? If you believe in God, is, is God real? Right. Can you prove God? And then, you know, I know I'm throwing a lot at you. Aren't most philosophers like atheists? Like sound like a lot of philosophers or like scientists are like, like atheists. Um, Okay. I mean, of course, I'm making all this shit up, right? Yeah. Okay. Could you say, okay, so the first thing was, I guess you were saying, does believing in God make it? Yeah, make it true. Like, so, yeah. There's something actually improve it, right? That's really an exam- um One of the, um, I love like um, going over the um, ontological argument with my students. And it basically kind of defends this position that, yes, believing in God does make God true. Because if God, um, is by you know nature of what God is a perfect being, then we would have to say that you know well first we would say that perfect beings they exist, and and that's just because to so say you have a perfect think about um just to understand this think about like the perfect set right that isn't going to be something that exists simply in your mind that's going to be something that actually exists right because it's perfect. There's something about the feature of perfection that makes it to where if it, 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 it exists, right? And so insofar as to be perfect, you, it has to exist. It can't just be an idea, right? Um, and then we say that God is perfect by virtue of being God. That's who God is, is a perfect being. Then we would have to argue that God being a perfect being necessarily exist so define perfect um um perf- well if we can't if we we're gonna define perfect then we would have to say that it's something that exists and it's not just an idea okay at least one of the features okay and so because perfection is defined in that way and then god is perfect then we would have to say then that god necessarily exists that's just the ontological argument for God. I'm not saying that I support that or anything like that, but that's one way that people have tried to prove God's existence. There are other people who say, okay, well, we don't just need to look at the ontology, look at, you know, the um, features or property of God to prove God's existence. We need to look at something like phenomenology or experiences and what are people's actually actual experiences with God. And if we go by experiences, Some people, so for example, some philosophers, a lot of black philosophers have argued this. Well, if God is by definition perfect, he would be good, right? And um, if God is, you know, is perfect, good being, then it wouldn't make sense for him to exist if we go by experiences. Why? Well, let's look at hunger. And how much hunger that the world, you know, um, and how much, how hungry people are, how, m- how much people suffer, you know, let's look at things like slavery, right? Like if God is good, he would not allow for these things to happen. He wouldn't allow for suffering. Um, if we look at actual experiences, God must be this white racist, you know, asshole, <laughs> you know, uh, and we just go by, you know, it, um, and, and, and so he couldn't be good. But if he's not good, then he's not God, right? Because yeah. God is supposed to be, by definition, this perfect good being. And so a lot of philosophers, Black philosophers, um, they have argued, well, you know, because of that, there must not be a God. God must not exist. And so you have all types of philosophers, yes, who will argue and who have argued 
that, yeah, there isn't a God, but there are philosophers like Cornel West who do believe that there that God does exist. So I'm, I'm actually reading this book now called uh, The God, God Illusion, right? This atheist from Britain wrote the book, right? And you, well, you said this, maybe think of a, a quote in there. He quoted Woody Allen, this like pedophile white guy, right? Who said, he just said atheist, right? And he said, I'm not saying I don't believe in God, but there's a guy who's underachieving, right? Because, you know, all the, all the hunger, all the starvation, right? You know? Yeah. And of course, like Christians will say, well, like, you know, it's because of free will, right? And then like, with, well, God, like what, what God is it? Like, you worship, right? Like the Sumerian gods, the, you know, gods from the Old Testament, you know, all the, all, so like, which God do you worship, right? Like, how do you decide that? Like, did I close you decide? Also, I think the biggest factor of deciding what God you worship or religion, like where you're born at, right? So I don't think there's many, like, you know, like um, Muslims and like, I don't know, like Iowa, you know. I mean, there, of course, there are like, but if like, you, if you're born in Saudi Arabia, you're probably not gonna be like a Jew, right? So I think so. Is a does that? I just don't think environment or where you're located actually pay for the religion, right? And of course, people will say like, if there's a true God, come this does to come this guy. Hey, I'm God. Do as I say, right? And of course, people say it's free will, faith, and all kind of stuff, right? It's just, and like, there's like, and then they say God says the same, right? Well, is that true, right? Old Testament God, like he was a ruthless guy right he he like stoning people to the death killing people right and then jesus came said basically forgive him for everything you know so it's like it's kind of confusing right right and like when you think about it i had one friend in the army she was like she's really religious she's like well i don't know this god but i believe in our god because like she was actually like suppose I, I those i didn't believe in god right yeah and then but that's actually god and i go to hell right right you know so i have a good time by i, I you know my eternal life's good on right mm -hmm. so why not just like worship god have a good life and then you know get reward after but if i die I just die at least i live a good life you know i mean to me i think it's just a personal decision right what you believe in right yeah or, or not definitely believe in, I believe in, right? definitely and i think you know the christian god would um or i even say i would explain that to um muslim jew god would also say that it should probably be a personal decision that's why so much in the old testament god is wrestling with people like literally and figuratively and saying like i want you to believe in me you know um and 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 if you don't that's gonna you know it's gonna cause these problems you know um because if you don't believe in me and what i'm doing yeah. and what i'm about then you know there's just gonna have to be some sort of consequences but it needs to be a personal choice um, so definitely, I think that it should be a personal choice. Yeah. And of course, no, like, I don't think people realize like how close the Jewish, Christian and Muslim religions are, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're pretty close, right? Like the Muslims, they believe in Jesus Christ as a prophet, not God, you know, they believe in Abraham, stuff like that. And then like, like in the, in the Old Testament Bible, like God always like talks to some random guy, right? Like, you know, Moses, who's like an Egyptian, right? Like he never says like a public address system, you know, hey, everyone on earth, do this it's always like some person that person like spreads a word so like my question was like what what better way for people in power to stay in power than say hey like what better way to keep people still stealing your goats and say hey our god commanded you not to steal right yeah so is it like and like like is the bible the best story ever told it could be you know maybe this bunch of fables passed down generation to generation you mm -hmm. know like like the, I think the New Testament was actually written like 400 years after Jesus died, you know. Mm -hmm. and of course, like back to those oral storytelling, right? You know, it's just so many questions, right? But then, in the, the day, like, do you have like, what do you believe in or not believe in, right? It's it's a personal decision, like you said, right? And I think too many people, of course, religion. So many people died through religion, like Crusades. The um, I, I read a book when I was in college called The Conquest of Islam, where Muhammad like basically like put people in the sword, like convert or die. Yeah. I want to live, right? I'm right. almost husband now, right? Right. You know, things we're never thinking about doing today, right? And then it's, yeah, it's it's a lot, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The question of religion is, you know, it's a very touchy topic, especially because a lot of people have trauma over it, Um, you know, because of stuff like you talk. Yeah, maybe people, I mean, I think there still are a lot of, um, around the world, even, even in the United States, um, a lot of harm done to people if they aren't part of certain, you yeah. know, major religions. Like, I, like uh -huh. I'm Roman Catholic, mainly because my grandmother was Catholic, more than Catholic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I follow the stuff. But then, like, all the stuff they did, you know, fucking boys, you know, all that kind of bullshit, you know? It's like, and I think every religion maybe has come some like a stain, you know? Like, all the people died because of religion, you know? Like, the Catholic Wars and, like, the Irish and England, right? It's, yeah, it's, I don't know. Yeah, it, it can be very destructive. 
um, if used as like a destructive tool. And it can also be very be productive. Yeah. yeah. And that's why we have so many different movements around the world um, that have drawn on different religious practices, different religions, different deities, and they've been able to create like amazing things from that. And so you've been Christian all your, all your life? Mm hmm So is that because like you're born into, is it like you're, you're like a um, Catholic, Southern Baptist, um, or, or just consider yourself Christian? Born into a non-denominational um, church um, community, and I would definitely say that I chose God, uh, you know, and that I'm very committed to loving God. And to me, that means, one, that I have to make a choice because love is a choice. Um, and then, two, I would say that it, in being a choice, or making the choice to love God, I've made a choice to get to know God, to understand who God is. It's like if I'm in a relationship with a friend or a spouse or, you know, a parent, right? To love them means to be receptive to the reality of who they are, the reality of who, what they're saying, that in that case. So I can't just say, okay, well, based on what I heard from you for two weeks or when I first met you, that's just how to, uh, that's how I'm going to draw, where I'm going to draw my information on how to love you. And then I'm not going to modify that, alter that. No, I have to be responsive to where that person is, who that person is, and understand that they are complex, that they are like vastly complex. And that that means that I'm going to be in this continuous process of trying to get to know them and to understand them and to love them there where they are and i think it's the same thing with god right like to love god means to explore god means to explore different facets of who god is um it means to explore you know whatever it is that god is saying um or however it is that god is communicating with me during the particular time um that i'm in and so that is definitely and it involves choice it doesn't just involve you know reading a scripture and believing in the scripture it involves this active responsiveness to you know god okay how the situation let's suppose some being came out of space right yeah and and like they have been yeah aliens we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute <laughs> suppose this, this something came out of space and somehow it proved that there was no God. It, 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 somehow proved like, hey, all this stuff we did, we did that as an experiment. You did a big science experiment, right? There's really no God. And to convince anybody in the world there's no God, right? Mm -hmm. And so you believe there's no God now, right? No. Will that change the way that, that change? <laughs> well, let's go along with it, right? Now. Okay, okay. Will that change the way you live your life? If I believe that there was no God, yeah. Because God operates as a star. So you become this all evil person. Life. No. Like, would you, I mean, you still be a good person. You still live life the right way, whatever that is, right? You're not, you're not going to go like, mass murdering people and like, like murdering people, like robbing and stealing and stuff, right? Definitely not, but it could mean that. It really depends. So God in religion, it gives people meaning. Mm -hmm. It calls people to make sense of the, it allows people, it's the, the very thing, the very framework that allows people to make sense of the world. So all of your actions, everything that you're saying to me, um, all the way that I can't, like the, the ways in which I've interpreted our relationship and everything that has transpired, that's all being filtered through my framework, which is my religion. Everybody has a religion, you know, even if they don't believe in God, but mine does have a religion. I mean, religion. atheism is a religion, right? Right. And so at the point where, you know, um, I've lost my framework to make sense of things. Now I have to go back and I have to be like, okay, well, how do I make sense of Jason yeah. now? How do I make sense of everything that Jason told me? But then I have to do that with everything in my life. And that can be a very scary experience for people. And it can even birth things like nihilism, you know, where you say there is no meaning. And from that, maybe you do start doing fuck shit, right? Or it could be a situation where you're like, okay, there is no meaning. I'm going to be like Nietzsche. So let me, and talk, I'm gonna, let me talk real fast. Yeah. That, that'd make a great t-shirt, doing fuck shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's what you're about. <laughs> stealing and whatever. I mean, stealing is bad. Yeah. So yeah. let's suppose like, like God did come 
and say, I'm God and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, everyone, okay, you're God. So do you think everyone will worship him? Like, will some people, like, reject him? Like, what do you think would happen? Like, like he said, you know, I'm, you know, I came back. I'm tired of all this religious fighting. I'm the, I'm the one true God. I'm the God of you know, Muhammad, Jesus, of Abraham, blah, blah, blah. I'm the God of Hindus people. I'm, I'm the God, right? Yeah. Stop this bullshit and, and worship me, right? Yeah. I think half the people would, half people like, no, you're not. I wonder if God would say worship me. And I think the That's reason good. why I asked, um, asked myself that is um, the brothers, oh, I can't remember. It's like brothers, um, Kamazarov is this one uh, philosophical text written by this really cool Russian dude. I can't remember his name right now. But he basically, he creates this story, um, this famous philosophical allegory that kind of goes through the same thing. Um, but it's set during the time of the Spanish Inquisition. So, you know, people have murdered people for not believing in God, all of that. That's kind of where it's set. And then Jesus comes back. Jesus doesn't say that he's Jesus, though. But Jesus is just kind of like walking around. And everybody knows that he's Jesus. Why? Because he's doing the same shit. You know, he's tailing people, all this other shit. And they just kind of have that vibe. Because if God were going to come down, he wouldn't just feel like a normal person. He's going to feel He'd like God. Vibe. Right. Yeah, it would have the vibe. And so um, in that story, it's really interesting because the leader of that time, they see Jesus, see the work that he's doing, and then they take him to this prison and where they ask him all these questions. And the, the whole time, the person is like super, super, the leader is super, super upset, super, super angry with Jesus. And it's just like, why? have you allowed just everything that you've allowed to happen? You know, like if you think about it, when it comes to the Christian God, when it comes to Jesus, he was like, Hey, I'm we're supposed to be about love. I'm going to do all this stuff and it's going to be great. And then he just left and he disappeared for like hundreds of years. And he was like, I'm going to be back. But then he didn't, he didn't come back. Right. Yeah. Like people are still waiting for yeah. him to come back. I think the Bible says, you know, I, basically I'm paraphrasing. It's like, I'll be back for the end of your life. Right. 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 And like, and, you know, like, but where is he at? And so, yes, the guy was like, okay, well, where are you? You know, well, why have you allowed or, all this? Or maybe it's like the end of your of spiritual life. Maybe we die. We're going to go to some kind of like, like waiting room, spiritual waiting room or something, you know? Like, what are you saying? Like, maybe Jesus is there to meet us there? No, I'm saying like, you know, like we we die our natural life, right? Yeah. But when Jesus said end of your life, they mean end of our, our physical life. He meant like, you know, end of our spiritual life, so to speak, right? Like, there's all this life that we don't know about. Like, maybe there, um, like we have different life cycles, yeah. and like we can um continue to like live this life until we go to maybe the end of our spiritual life, and then at that point, Jesus will be like, "Well done, my faithful servant. You did yeah. amazing." Yeah, kind of thing. about the so many inconsistencies, right? You know, like like I said, like you know, back for the new year life, you know, it's I don't know. It's the Bible is interesting to read. And one, one thing gets me too, like there's so many people that would like say they're religious and stuff, you know, and mm -hmm. a lot of preachers like. But have you read of the Bible? Probably not, right? Like, oh yeah, I think a lot of people, um, and even if they have read it, they read it through a particular or, lens, or, or they pick and choose, you know, like, and, and no, again, like this was on TV a while ago where this guy he went to like different people, like, hey, I'm gonna read you, I'm gonna read you the the Muslim Bible is called Quran, right? Yeah. So I'm going to read a passage of the Quran, right? It's like, you know, how about murdering, killing people, right? You know, oh my God, that's so blah, blah, blah. The Christian Bible does that a lot. Yeah, too. and there, it was some, it was some, it was some, he was reading the Christian Bible, right? He, oh, I lied. This is the Old Testament. Yeah. You know, not, and he had his film, like, in the Old Testament, like, you know, one part, God tells the Israelites to go, like, rape and murder everyone in the town, right? Because they disobeyed him, right? So they were, like, raping and murdering, like, kids and females, right? <laughs> He said rape, but he definitely said make sure you kill everybody, especially the baby, and all, yeah. especially but also the babies, yeah. and and also the cows and all of that. Yeah. The, the, the stuff, yeah. And then like I won't say this like that, but you know, in the New Testament, it's like this loving God, like you know, but still the first. A lot of people get the Pharisees, a lot of criticism, right? Because they, but like, if you're a Pharisee, right, use the Old Testament with God, and then Jesus comes, like who are you, right? Like you're some random dude from Bethlehem, or whatever, like saying you're God, like no, you're not, right? So like, but Jesus, like you no. Know, a new way to do things right yeah and yeah it's like a you know just like of course it's like a 500 year snap of course you know right and then it's like so how do you make sense of this different god if god is you know not supposed to change you know and yeah. he's just supposed to yeah, be like, this yeah. being god like, I, what's it, I, I am like I, I am i'm oh forever or something like that you know the omega i'm never changing up and like obviously that's a big change for me like right you know killing people for touching a pig skin, you know, or pig, you know, the versus, you know, forgiving everyone. Dying for them. 
Yeah. Not just forgiving, like dying for them and then telling everybody to model after me and die for them too. Yeah. Can, can you imagine, yeah. like, like, let's say, let's imagine a, pre, uh, a Jewish priest in the Old Testament was found, um, what's I'm looking for, like a, talking to a prostitute, right? Yeah. But in Jesus, you know, what his people were. Right, right. You know, in the Old Testament, that priest would like, would got, you know, beheaded, like, you know, killed, right? Stoned yeah. to death. But, you know, what Jesus knows. Jesus would ride in the sand and be like, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. he who has not yeah. sinned, throw yeah. the first stone. Yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> yeah. Or like, Old Testament, them jokers throwing stones left and right. Yeah. For me, like, the way that I make sense of it, um, and this may not be the right way to make sense of it, um, but the way that I make sense of it is just to say that, first of all, I think to to not impose or project other people's understanding of God onto the meaning of what God has said about himself or themselves. And so that means that I'm going to understand God and also, so and then, okay, so to do that, and then also to understand that God is an infinite being. And being an infinite being and this like infinitely complex being with so many features to to it, you know, I can't just say this is God. I can't ever box God into something. I have to understand that God is infinite and I can't just understand him. And so if God is changing or something like that, maybe it's not that or it appears like God is changing. Maybe God isn't necessarily changing. Maybe I'm just understanding a new facet of God or I'm relating to God in a different kind of way. Or, or, but I, or, or maybe like, you know, God changes based on our ability to accept different things, right? Maybe Old Testament God did things so we could accept it, right? right. Now, now our brains are changed and yes. it's like, now we can, you know, accept different things. Like, this could be enough. And I think, you know, and the it says that, you know, in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, like, God is preparing people's hearts so that people can consume Jesus. And he literally broke his body and he gave it to people and he served it up to people and he served it to himself, the body of Christ. Um, and he did it in a way where people, um, or at a point rather, where people were prepared to consume him, where people were compared to engage with him. And so that definitely makes sense. I think, too, on the topic of just this, you know, understanding God, um, I think, you know, and, and the differences in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, I think that's why you have Jews who are like, no, I can't mess with it. Maybe Jesus is a prophet, but this is a completely different person. Yeah, they have a whole different vibe, whole different, you know, complexity. Like, this is like, you know, like the rules are changed. The, rules, too much <laughs> the rules are changed, like, totally, right? Yeah. Like, forgiveness. What's forgiveness? Right. Like, I have a bag of stones in my backyard like like in case i need to stone someone right <laughs> now, now, now you're telling me to like, throw the stones away like literally i didn't feel like i got it until i watched that one show do you know um it's handmaid's have you seen handmaid's tell i've heard about it but watched it it is it's really i you should watch it if you have time but they like literally go over the scene where they're like throwing stones they do that like weekly mm -hmm. And so you, you really, I really see it. And so you're like, oh, <laughs> this is what I would have to do. <laughs> so you, we talked about aliens a little bit earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Let's suppose that we could prove aliens are here, right? Well, we have. They literally came, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so since aliens are here, does that prove or disprove there's a God? So like in the, in the, in the Bible, it says, no, God, you know, there's one God, you know, the only earth, right? We're the only types of life here. So there's a town of life anywhere, everywhere. Like, does that, the God, like that's like really increase the out of God being real or like I don't see why it would. I think the existence of other species um shouldn't make it to where we think that like just because there, we found these new species doesn't mean that these new species are God. And because these new species aren't God, or at the point where we concede, okay, they're not God, then we're not challenging the notion that there is one God or that there is this particular God. We're just saying there's this new species. And we do that all of the time. Like, you know, people are still making, scientists are still making different discoveries, seeing, okay, well, there's this new flora, there's new fonts, there's new, you know, animal species, you know, they're still doing that. And so, and we don't say, okay, well, because we found this new research, this new, that suggests that there's this new species, we don't say that, oh, that means that there is no God. Yeah. We just say, okay, well, that's just something else that we know. Yeah. So like, for me, like on the one hand, Talking about two extremes. On one hand, like if you believe in God, believe in the Bible, like there's a lot of inconsistency right there. Like if you're a strictly logical person, like think about like 
what kind of logic makes you like logic like you know this lady became pregnant without being pregnant you know with no father right like what kind of sense does that make right the other hand like yeah do you really believe or like a lot of scientists are they to believe like the big bang theory so mm-hmm. on one hand like you know like the religion right a lot, a lot of logical flaws but to me the, like two atoms hitting each other together making big bang to me that's not logical either right yeah so to me that the truth has to be somewhere in the middle right Definitely. I think the existence of aliens itself, um, I was talking to my partner about this, um, David, uh, we're, we're talking about how the existence of aliens itself and like how they've evolved and their place in our human evolution suggests that both um, the evolution theory is wrong. And then also that the, the Bible, if we just strictly adhere to its literal interpretation and its creation myth is also wrong. Um, and so it would have to be, I don't know if it's somewhere in the middle that we would have to go to understand the correct narrative, um, or the right narrative. Um, but it would definitely be, be something different. So you're talking about the uh, Spanish like, conquistadors, like going to like, um, I guess like Peru and stuff like, and I think back then, like the conquistadors came and I, and I, and the, I think the country was Peru, the Inca empire, right? Mm-hmm. They had like the religious text, like these gods or white gods going to come right. And of course the Spanish came, right? They, I mean, although they Spanish, they were white. And so they took advantage of it, like pretty much destroyed the country, right? Right. So like just imagine some aliens came, right? Right. And like, you know, I'm, and they say I'm God, right? Mm-hmm. That's one thing. Like, like a lot of people say, no, we want aliens to come. Like, of course they're here, but do we want aliens to come, right? Do we want aliens to come? Are they going to be bene- benevolent or like, like benevolent? Yeah. Or- like, yeah, I think, I, like destroy us and like you know, like make us slaves, all kind of shit, you know. Yeah, I think that fear is is uh something that um anyone who is born and raised in a colonial, <laughs> at least, yeah. you know, what have in general about it. Like, I think we we have that kind of fear in in general, um, whether it's towards immigrants, aliens, you know, who we you know. So um, so that fear definitely makes sense. I think to me, it's just sort of like, okay, well, it's here, you know, if they're here, they're here. And so how are we going to interact with it? Yeah. How are we going to um, live out our best selves in, 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 in interacting with them, given that they are here yeah. and, you know, maybe they are benevolent, but I think that could be like with any person, right? Like you don't know if the love of your life could hurt you or harm you. You don't know if, the person that you may want to be best friends with could hurt you or harm you, but you still kind of work with it because that's just life. That's just what life is. You got to either move in fear or you got to move in some other sort of ethos. Um, and so I think just making those sort of decisions are, yeah, that's just kind of what we have to do. Yeah. I can remember a few months ago when the Pentagon pretty much admitted that aliens are here, right? Yeah. Like the joke was like, no one paid attention, right? Like one person put on, like, a, on, on, I think Facebook, yeah, aliens are here, but unless have me pay my rent, I really don't care, right? Yeah. Like, you know, they're not destroying us, so like, I, I, I have for my life to live, right? I feel really sad that people say that because I think it really speaks to how nihilistic people are um, and how they've just found or they've come to believe that it is meaningless to try and change things. The, yeah, I know that things are bad, but I can't do anything about it. The system is too big. Everything is too big, including the aliens, for me to actually do something. So I'm just going to continue doing whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, to me, that's really sad because I think whether we're talking about aliens, whether we're talking about our communities, our government, I think I, I, people should have this sense that they can change things, that they can not just be beings that, um, are acted on, but beings that act on things in the world and can change the world. But because people don't have that sense, I think that that's kind of where they're at with it. And also, I mean, I think there is kind of like some, it, it makes sense intuitively to have that disposition though. Because, I mean, if the aliens are here, they're here. And either they're going to kill us or they're not. I mean, they haven't, they haven't killed us yet. I mean, at least not that. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not going to be worrying about it. You know, the, I'm going to worry about what I have to worry about today. <laughs> I, I, and, and and then whatever happens to mom, I'll worry about that tomorrow. Yeah. I get that. So uh, there was a, they should probably just get on a show, right? And it's like, it has like, you know, an alien buying, right? And like the earth is going to end like in like 24 hours, right? Yeah. He said, I'm going to introduce you to like things they call like some alien name, right? Hey, this is so-and-so. Uh, he gave us like, 
iPhone, you know, all this stuff. He gave it to us, right? Mm-hmm. And I, hey, he, I'm, uh, you know, we're gonna, are we gonna die in 24 hours? Except for me, I'm going to some planet, right? So like maybe aliens like came like in the 1700s, and gave us all this technology, you know, like you know, who knows, right? Definitely, I think from what I've heard, the alien that does exist, um, or that we um have found out about that they've literally said we were here before. And then we left, and now we're back. So I had a guy on the podcast. Actually, he was, uh, you might have met him at the pitch conversation we did, uh, at Alec Mosloff. Okay. So um, he was telling me on the podcast when he was on, like, the, the Sumerian, there's, like, Sumerian religion, the gods, right? They believe that um, aliens came and put the DNA in, like, in, like, like early, you know, the humans, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. of that, humans, like, transformed, like, you know, like, based, like, apes to, like, you know, the humans, right? Mm-hmm. Talk about DNA splice and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Uh, that's some crazy stuff. <laughs> There's some crazy stuff out there, right? Yeah, it's like, it's like you know, like you know, it's, it's a lot of crazy stuff out there, right? Yeah, I think for me, um, even bigger than the aliens is just like, how are we going to? What are we going to do about climate change? How are we going to love each other better? How am I going to love myself better? You know, I feel I not even just bigger. It's just like in addition to that. And I feel like there's all of these big questions that all of us have. And in, in addition to, is a pandemic going to get worse? And we're going to have to go back on that, you know, and um, really just being present to those issues and not just moving day to day and just like keep going and being like, okay, like I am this human being who's been created in this time period. And, and during this time, we're going through all this stuff. And so I'm experiencing all this stuff. And what does that mean for me? You know, all right. I think yeah. that's yeah. I think that's I want to be able to take time and do that, and that includes the aliens and all of that, and just to to reflect. Yeah. So next question for you, and uh, and David, you're listening. Listen to the answer. So what makes you happy? Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh, that's cute. Take take, take notes, David, if take, you're listening. What makes you happy? I feel like he has a good understanding. <laughs> um. I would say God, connecting with God. Um, I really have a personal relationship with God. And whenever I connect to the spirit, I feel like I feel not just happiness, joy and love um, and an understanding of where I'm supposed to go. Um, I would say being financially stable makes me happy. Um, and not just stable, <laughs> but like in a really great, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's kind of important. That's kind of important. Yeah. Yeah. But mostly I felt like just teaching. And um, that's my heart. Teaching is your passion, right? Yeah. I love... Teaching, pa- teaching yeah. philosophy is your passion. And just creating spaces of belonging with people where everyone understands they're of value and they're not disposable. Because um, there's been so many spaces I've entered into where I had this sense where I could be as disposable, especially in workspaces you know, in, in spaces where I needed to make money. And so just creating alternative spaces, um, cultural counter, um, counter, counter spaces where people really understand that uh, where love is the foundation is my goal. And that is where um, I feel like that's where I'm at my best and where I'm happy. So what's your, like your, of course, we'll talk about Black music in a minute. But as far as like you being a philosophy teacher, like, what's your goal with that? Is it goal to be, like, you know, a philosophy teacher at Harvard, like the head of a philosophy department somewhere? Or is it just give your students the best experience possible? Um, I would, I don't know if either of those experiences would be my goal. Um, I think when it comes to my students, it really is just to meet them where they are in love and to create a space where they can play with ideas and where they gain the strength, the courage, or they enhance the strength and the courage that they already have to connect to reality, to be present with reality, to explore reality, and to build something, build a, a wisdom from that and to share it with the world and to find uh, effective ways to share that with the world. And to do that in community with other people um, who are also grounded in love and, and just this spirit of confluence. Um, so I think that is my goal, is to 
create spaces where students can really build something where they can be creative and they can really build and, and, and to create work that they're proud of. So in college, like most people go to college, they want to make all A's, right? Mm-hmm. They study, study, study. But you, you actually learn your most valuable lessons by failing, right? So of oh, course, yeah. you can't make all A's and fail, right? So how do you, how do you, how do you, how should people balance like, like doing the best you can and still like learn lessons of failing? Cause like, if you make an A, you know, everything's going pretty good, right? But I won't say fail the class, of course, but like maybe you struggle, right? It's like, how do you like balance that? Does that make any sense? No, um, I think that does make sense. I, I won't, I, I don't know if I would agree that in college people have this desire to make A's. At least well, not I, in I, my I, classes. I, yeah, I it, you probably because you know you had that experience. You went to um the University of Oklahoma, right? Yeah. And then you kind of and then you, when you were ready, you were like, okay, I'm gonna do this, yeah. you know. And so you were like, okay, well if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it right. Yeah. Um, and so you had that kind of disposition. I would say. Um, so I've taught a lot of different universities. Um, I also taught uh and in child teaching at universities like through the University of Houston Clear Lake. I've taught in prisons. Um, in just different educational settings. And so different people have different goals. So if I'm at UConn, primarily white institution, yeah, they're going to be like, bitch, give me an A, you know. <laughs> um, and that's going to be different if I'm at TSU. And if you don't, their parents going to fucking do a, like, stalk you online or something probably. No, I don't want to have that much interaction with parents. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to get, like, super nasty emails from students. Mm-hmm. And, like, I don't, like, just... But I don't get a, get a one star review on the, on the on teacher surveys, whatever. Yeah, and they're they're gonna report me, you know, <laughs> because they don't understand why. Um, just because they didn't or didn't, yeah, they didn't do the work. That means that they can't get an A. So, um, I would say yeah, it depends on what institute institution I'm at. At some institutions, the the goal for the students isn't to get an A. Like I would say, um, teaching at primarily Hispanic institutions like HCC has taught me that um, different people have different values. So like when I've taught there, it's like education is really important. And I want, and I, because I value my education, I am going to create, a, I'm going to make sure that I get this. I'm going to make sure that I can, I can work with this. Right. Um, and that's been really beautiful when I'm in, you know, in the prison, um, the goal has been to, uh, they really, really, really want to, help people to 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 create better space i've seen it all across the board and so they're like well when i'm out how can i use this knowledge to change you know when i you know and they may not care about the a as much um they i mean obviously they have to have a certain grade to maintain in the program so they may care about that but they're not super concerned with an a and so i would say different institutions they may care about a's and they may care about other other things um and but yeah i think in in terms of just dealing with students who want a's um i explained at the beginning of my semester of the semester hey if you want an a this is what is required do not come to me do not and i say in this exact voice do not come to me asking at the end of the semester just telling me oh i want an a i want an a Cause you're not going to get one. And actually, if you say that it's going to irritate me and I'm going to send the exact email. I'm gonna, I show them the email, you know, this is the email I'm going to send in response at the end of the semester. When you ask about getting an A, I'm going to send, okay, this is exact. Uh, this is um, what is required to get an A. And if you haven't done these things, then you won't get an A, you'll get this grade, you know? So that's kind of how I deal with it. Cause I don't think everybody deserves an A and I don't think everybody needs to have an A to me education my classes is just about and at the end day, at the day having an a is not gonna get you a job you know like no one i, I don't know anybody who hired somebody off of a grade point average i think for black and brown students it may be a different bit different mm-hmm. i think a lot of um like if you're like at a pwi and maybe you're already connected to people uh, maybe you're connected to certain programs, organizations, the university has resources, you can get a job because your professor or someone there has resources to connect yeah, you. Yeah, that's, but if that's, you're at a well, that's networking, not great point average. Right. But if you're at a if you're at a black institute and maybe your university does not have that resource resources. And so a lot of companies, they're not gonna necessarily hire you like they would hire someone who's at 
maybe went to the University of Oklahoma. And so maybe in your mind, the thing that you need to get is an A because you don't have that resources. You can't network yeah. like that. Like I'm saying, and so like, you're going to have to try and or at least the students think they need to get an A. Maybe so, but I don't know anyone who like during the resume says, I don't know anyone who made a hard decision. I'm going to hire Jason over Tom Brown because Jason has a 3.7. This guy has a 2.5. I've never seen that happen. Really? I, 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 maybe it depends on like what the, the field is too. Because I would say like if you're in a field where you know, the knowledge, like you have to be able to do certain things. And, and, and if you but, have a 2.5, but if you are in certain fields, like I'm thinking like medicine or something like that, yeah, yeah, if you're like, it, it would if be you're, if you're like medicine lawyer. Yeah. You need to have a high grade point average, right? Like advice I give people and like a lot of parents would disagree with this. Like I tell people like going to college, like if you want to be like a doctor or lawyer, like you want to get a Harvard business school, like, yeah, you got to get a high grade point average. But if you just want to like, like have a regular life, just to like get a business degree, like C's get the degrees, right? Like get to, just a degree and, and enjoy college, right? I think there's more goodness in college, like socializing for, to an extent, of course, right? Like, like, I, I, like example I'll give, like suppose like someone has like an a, 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 a average in history, right? And they stay really hard for the final and get an A, they get an A, right? But that weekend, their friends invite them to go to Vegas. They're going to Vegas, right? And if you like totally blow off the exam, you'll still get a C plus, right? So pass, right? I tell people like, go to Vegas, right? Get the experience, right? I think that it really depends on your position in society. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a black and brown student or black and brown student, you, your family doesn't have resources. What if they do have resources? If they do, then sure. But a lot because of our socioeconomic structure, likely the chance is, is that they may not. And if they don't, and, and they don't get that A, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't, but, I wouldn't say I'm, that for them. I don't think you can, wouldn't it be better can for them say to that go, for them. Wouldn't it be better for them to go to Vegas with 10 of their friends and hang out? Because the friends might be like, you know, like, well off, might know people right. It, it, uh, I mean, if they are at an HBCU and they're interacting with other students at an HBCU or it, something yeah. like that, um, then I'm not sure that's, or even if they're at a community or maybe they're not, their, their college isn't even like in the top, you know, then, and there's an issue when it comes to resources, I think like whatever you can do, make sure they, and so that includes, because it's not just about the A, it's about the recommendation letter from the, the professor. And if you just decided not to go, you didn't communicate with the professor, you didn't try and work anything out. And then the professor, you and now you are in a position where, you know, the class is over and you have to ask the professor for a recommendation letter and you can't because you just skipped class and you, what, and you didn't communicate. Then not only are you in a situation where unlike certain uh, students who can network and they just have access to what the CEO or whatever, um, and, or their parent, their, you know, their, um, cousin or their, uh, a family friend is just saying, Hey, you can get an internship here. Unlike them, they don't have those connections. They can't network like that. And then now not only can they not network now, they can't even get a recommendation letter and they have a C I'm like, okay, okay. come on. Okay. Come on, baby. Okay. You, 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 you got to work with me. You have two students. Yeah. One is an A plus student, right? Mm -hmm. But they never talk to you. Never like, they make a, they never talk to every seat. You, don't, you know who they are, but you don't know who they are, right? Right. Uh, have another student that's struggling, right? D plus, C minus, right? They talk to you every day. Hey, how you doing? Um, so and, and like in college, you go by Taylor, you go by Mrs. Taylor, what they call you? Hi, Taylor. Okay, Taylor. Mm -hmm. So, hey, you know, I hope you're having a good day. Every day to talk to you, right? So, mm -hmm. you know this person, right? You only give one letter of recommendation. Who are you going to give it to? The A plus student who never talked to you? Or the C plus student who struggles, who talks to you every day. If the student is talking to me and communicating in class, then they would have a better grade than the student who I wouldn't know. Um, that's just the way that my grading skill is created because it's like a huge part of it is participation. And so if I know you, I'm talking, I understand your ideas, and I know that you've been doing the work, then okay. you would automatically get so, a good so, grade. So, and so you would get that recommendation so, so letter. So you change the question. So one has A, one has a C. Okay. Which one do you give the recommendation to? Um, I mean, I, I, the, the, if they have an A, then they have done the work to get a recommendation letter. So you're going to give that over the person who talks to you every day and tries to get better? If they are doing that, they may not have a C. 
And that's what I'm saying. My, the way I grade is different. If they're participating, they should have a good grade. Okay. So if any of her students are listening, <laughs> make sure you say hi to her every day in class. But you if you say you, hi, you got to talk about the- Got me engaged, yeah, got me engaged, yeah. Okay. You'll be able to, I will, I, if it's a come from a B to a A or a C to a B, I'm going to get you there if you, if you did the work. Okay. And I saw you do the work, yeah. I will make sure that you get that grade. And I will make sure I put myself in a position where I can write you a recommendation letter because I know you put in the effort. Okay. Yeah. Um, what can people do with a philosophy degree besides teach? Uh, besides teach, I mean, there's so many different things. Like, um, say you specialize in logic, um, you can get uh, a job um, doing um, different work in different companies around that. Um, you know, a lot of people who specialize in logic, they go on or they actually in, in during their undergrad, they go on to get um to become lawyers. Um, that's why a lot of students even take philosophy is so that it's, they can it's basically like a pre-law degree, right? Yeah. Well, no, I wouldn't say it, it, it's a record a prerequisite to do well um on the test to get into law school. Um, but I wouldn't say it's like a pre-law degree. Um, but yeah, so, um, also, you know, with the stuff that we're doing with black news, say you, uh, you know, concentrated in philosophy and then you created some sort of virtual simulation, you can make really great money off of doing that, off of selling those products, um, that really some sort of philosophical educational product. Um, so you can make good money doing that. Um, and I would say like a lot of people who work in like just do, doing some so, um, forms of social work. Um, you know, they could, um, like become, yeah, philosophers and then enter into the social work and they could, um, make use of their degree in that way too. If you, if you, if you had the power, what would you change about the education system in the United States? Either like junior high, high school, college, like over to Craig, what do you change about education? I would just say, I would want it to be grounded in love and I would want it to be something that is exciting for students. Um, I think if it's grounded in love, it would be exciting. And if it's grounded in love, it would encourage deep idea. It would encourage this reflection of the soul and this reflection, deep reflection of reality itself. Um, and so I think that, yeah, I would just want it to be. And, and also it would encourage a certain type of relationship with other people um, that encourages, that cultivates meaningful, lasting, sustainable relationships and communities. Um, and so, yeah, I would just say I would I would want it to be grounded in love. Talk about the importance of people having a critical thinking skills. Critical thinking skills. Um, well, I think just. I think people should and whatever it is that they do, they should know why they're doing it. They should understand how it connects to their purpose. Um, they should understand how it connects to the overall big picture. They should be able to do that and they should have the research skills. They should have the um, intellectual humility, the intellectual courage. Um, and all this is involved in critical thinking to be able to do that work. Um, if you don't know that and your education is fragmented, if you don't really understand like what you're doing and why you're doing it, you're not gonna enjoy it. And also, you're going to have a limited understanding. And so you're just going to be restricted in general. Um, and so to kind of get around that, you know, develop those critical thinking skills so that you can enjoy life and enjoy education. Do you think everyone should go to college? No. Why? Why not? Some people don't need to go to college. So like with Black Muse, um, there are a lot of students um, coming through Black Muse who they may not need to go to college. Uh, say that they specialize in quantum literacy, which is this really hot field now. A lot of people um, are doing a lot like, in, in the field of quantum literacy. So say they do that, right? Um, and they can do that without getting a, through Black Muse, and they can do that without getting a certification. It's way less um, expensive, and also they learn a lot then it would probably be better for them to do that. Maybe they have to pick up a certification or two um, through the process, but they will, they, if it leads them to be more successful, it will be better. 
And so what people do um, in deciding whether or not they go to college is really just going to be based on their needs and um, how much money they want to make and just what they want to do. And so if there are opportunities for people where um, maybe they don't have to go to college to do what they want to do or have to go to college to experience whatever their version of success is, then they should definitely not go to college and do whatever that thing is. So is there a philosopher living or dead that you would like to spend like a, a, like some time on? Um, we talked about Cornel West a lot. I would say Cornel West. Um, before I probably would have said before Bell Hooks died, I would have said Bell Hooks. So who's Bell Hooks? Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks uh, very famous um, black feminist. Okay. Oh, famous in the black feminist circle. Okay. Um, also did work on um, pedagogy and other um, okay. social sciences and stuff like that. But yeah, I would say. So those two. Yeah. Is there like a, so there's all these like different styles of philosophy. Is there a certain philosophy like you, I don't want to say believe in the most, but like, like you follow the most, or like you're drawn to the most? Existentialism. Okay. Yeah. Can you give us like a dummies one-on-one what that is? Yeah, definitely. So like just thinking about life's purpose, life's meaning, um, what should I do? Why am I here? Um, human, I- and also thinking through questions around human identity. So who am I? What does it even mean to be a human? Um, you know, if you're, if you're thinking through those sort of things, if you're concerned with those sort of topics, you're basically doing existentialism. So what's um, a type of philosophy you do like, they have, to- they have to have it totally wrong? Totally wrong? Yeah, like, like, like this philosophy, like, believe, this philosophy, like, believes in this, but like, okay, this is not right. Hmm. Like, I don't, like, you, like, totally dis- disagree with it. I don't know if I would count any philosophy out i think there's always something generative that we can take yeah um and even just the understanding that this is not the way to go to enter this question um is really helpful because then it's like just to our consciousness of things is based on understanding what things are not like i understand what white is from understanding what darkness is or what black is right and so to understand, okay, well, this isn't it. This isn't, and then I think life is like that too, right? We go through things, make mistakes, and then through that process of making mistakes and doing things wrong, quote unquote wrong, then we find out what the right is or what the closest to the right will look like. And so I would say that philosophical uh, theories, methods, like that, that have maybe gotten certain things wrong are perhaps the most beneficial to us than finding some particular answer that we think is super, super great because they point us in, in, in a better direction. Okay. So you may or may not know, know the answer to the question, right? But like, no, way, way back in the day, you had Aristotle's Plato. Mm-hmm. There's like all these Roman philosophers. Yeah. What, like, of course that's because of like the Western history, right? What are, are there like any like African philosophers in that time period? Like, like, like people don't know about that actually existed like like even better than Aristotle and Plato definitely so when I begin my class um I oftentimes begin talking about Antis work um and he's an African philosopher I also go over Zara Jacob's work um African Ethiopian uh, yeah African philosopher um and so um and of course you know you have people like Confucius all of that um asian philosophy has like this super rich history a lot of the great philosophers they say themselves that they got their ideas from them and from certain african philosophers um so definitely okay cool um so how about this question are there any like how for this like are there any philosophers now who are like what how for this what philosophers out there right now you think like a thousand years is gonna be like no it's a Plato or Aristotle or of our time, right? Like who's like a future, like okay, this philosopher like was really good, makes any sense. That their work is timeless. Yeah, time that's it, yeah. Who who thinks who's the thing is a timeless philosopher right now? I um uh, hmm. What I would say is that it would depend on 
So right now we're in this like very peculiar position where different disciplines and fields are being created because there's more openness to what we can learn and what education is. And so because of that, uh, this sort of position that we're in um, and people are developing different ideas and they're doing it and developing disciplines in a very unique way, I'm not sure what's going to be the product of that. I'm not sure what's going to be the result of that, where people are, what people are going to come to think of as important to learn or as, uh, yeah, as important to learn. And, 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 uh, and, and I'm not sure also the standards of the disciplines and how, and what they're going to think about in terms of methodology and, and what kind of methodology is important. And so because those things are still up in the air because people are developing these things, I'm not sure where people are going to turn to and come to think of or what people are going to come to think of as timeless. Um, yeah, that's just, that, that is what I would say. Um, yeah, and I think that's super, super cool that we're in this beautiful time period where we're not just kind of staying stagnant. Um, a lot of people are really working to be innovative and develop different disciplines and different ways of learning, different methodologies and different understandings of what education is in and of itself. And as this is taking place, uh, like the, the college system, primary and secondary education is also changing. And so um, I think that will definitely influence where people decide to turn to um, and understanding, you know, this is what we should be, you know, be thinking about. Uh, so, yeah, I would say I really don't know, but I, I think that, uh, yeah, I have faith in, in people and in, in, in creating beautiful things. So this next question, we're going to like suppose that you're, you're in the top 1% of society, right? What that means, you're top 1%. Okay. Do you rather three options, live today, 500 years in the future, or 500 years in the past? Wait, I'm top 1%? Like I'm like the richest like yeah, billionaire? Top 1% of the world. And I have the, and, and this question is based on the idea that I have so much money that I can time travel. No, you can't, don't time travel. You have to be like one place permanently. Okay. The future now is five years past. Oh, well, how am I able to travel in the future? Okay. Um, I would be here. I believe that I'm meant to be here in this moment and that there are particular needs in the society that I'm meant to help address. Okay. Yeah. Like that, Anne. Yeah. What about you? Um, I stay here too, right? Yeah. Life is good, right? Yeah. Like 500 years ago, like there's no indoor plumbing, there's no AC. People die from malaria, people behind a plague, you know, like, like, it's just craziness. Five years in the future, we might, the Earth might have been here in five years in the future. Yeah. You know, we might be living on Pluto or some craziness, you know? Yeah. And I think also background, you know, like, what is your ethnicity? Like, are you like, what, yeah, what is, where are you from? Like, yeah. your people from? Yeah. Are you like British, German? Because I think that would impact, like, you know, I'm a black person, you know, <laughs> I'm traveling <laughs> backwards. It's like, where am I going? <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> arrive on a slave ship or some, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. That's just funny, though. Yeah. So, one thing I give you props for, like, like, every question I ask you, like, you tied it back to the black in some kind of way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, like, right. yeah, you, I did it. <laughs> like, you did that down pat. So let's talk about Black Muse. Okay. So what does Black Muse do? Um, we basically work to transform the educational system using uh, innovative technology like the metaverse. Um, and just, yeah, like the Vera has says, all of that. You're very polished at this. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, bam, 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 bam. So like, what, what, so... The metaverse, it wasn't really, I mean, I know Mark Zuckerberg came back, metaverse, right? But did the metaverse really become the biggest, the big thing that people thought it was going to be? Well, right now, like people are investing billions of dollars into it. Um, and because and in from different fields, like it like from fashion to architect, you know, uh be, to cars like BMW, you know, a lot of people are investing a lot of money into it. And so I think that it is gearing up to be a very big thing. Uh, I will say that right now, a lot of people don't even know what the metaverse is and yeah. how to access it, and they don't have the funds to do it. So uh, either they don't have the $300 to buy the VR headset to ac access virtual realities, maybe they can access certain T 2D metaverse worlds, 
like stain block. Oh, sorry. Um, like, um, uh, like, um, <laughs> just interland, um, or scent blocks, but they can't access these virtual, um, re, um, reality worlds, um, in the metaverse, or they don't have the funds to pay for certain augmented reality, um, you know, metaverse worlds. And so access is a big thing. Um, and it's a big factor in why people don't even know about it yet. Um, but I think, as more people gain access to the metaverse um, and it becomes something that a lot of like it is more affordable, basically, I think that more people will know about it and more people will be able to use and more people will use it because it's really, really awesome. Um, and that's why, you know, Black News, one of our goals um, that we really, really are working toward is to uh, build our own cheap, affordable VR headsets. Um, for people so they can access it because it's really crazy that people have to pay, you know, like $300 just to access certain virtual worlds. So recently, y'all um, convinced, I the wrong word to use, but recently y'all convinced, I think, the Coma Metro Park is joining y'all, right? Mm-hmm. Think about the, talk through the process of how you convinced them to become a partner with you. Uh, we just showed them our work and they were like, they loved uh, it. I'm sure it was more, more complex than that. No, like literally, um, and that's why I believe in God, because amen, okay? Uh, literally, it was just a simple matter of they saw the work, and then um, they invited I'm sure us you, to... I'm sure, you, I'm sure you just like, their heads. I'm sure you did research, practice your presentations, and... It was literally, we went to a networking event, um, connected to um, this uh, really incredible organization that was already connected to uh, the Metro Parks. Um, she sent them our work and then they, uh, said they wanted to work with us. And how's that partnership been working out for y'all so far? Like what value, so what value have they gotten from you? What value have y'all gotten from them? Well, I can say when it comes to the students, it's been incredible. Like teaching this stuff to students is just one of the most beautiful, exciting experiences. And I'm really, really grateful to be a part of it, um, to be able to help them um, go through these different journeys where they are carving out a career path for themselves, where they have certain skills, certain future ready skills to be able to do, um, you know, work lucrative uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to be able to um, gain like lucrative um, job opportunities and have fun in doing it. Because we talk, you know, so much about our educational environment and how it's not conducive for a lot of students. Um, and it's not exciting for students. Um, and so just to create educational experiences that are exciting um, and educational experiences where students actually understand like why are they are doing the things that they're doing and to create educational experiences where students, um, where they can, they, they can have something created that they can make money off of after the course I feel like that's to help do that, to be a part of um, a community that is working to do that is just has added a lot of value to my life. In regards to the students themselves, um, you know, it's been, you know, our uh, recently working with the students at Metro Parks. I think they just like, <laughs> you know, being on the headset, <laughs> playing around, going to the different worlds and stuff. I think they just like it. Um, we um, also we recently um, have taught at um, juvenile rehabilitation program at Oak Ridge, um, and these are more like eighteen to twenty five. The students that we teach at Metro Parks are younger, um, you know, eight to eighteen. Uh, I just for them, just having this, there's so many opportunities that are open to them because of this, um, and in science and all sorts of things. Like there's this one student who was like. Can I create, can we create a metaverse world that's based on the um, periodic table? And then from that, create different, um, you know, uh, molecules or something like that, you know? There's all sorts of opportunities that are being made available to them. And I think that it's adding value to their lives in that way. But then also, um, you know, it's adding, adding monetary, um, amount of, like, money, uh, you know, amount of, <laughs> Jason, healthy monetary value to them. Um, and because we're going to be doing a business pitch competitions at the end of the course that we're doing now. 
um, the one of the organizations that David is, um, he's a co-founder of Black Muse, um, that he's connected to, they're doing a business pitch um, where students get a $250,000, $100,000 um, or a possibility of doing that at the end of it. And then um, we're going to try and do like a, a competition of our own for the students. So they have, you know, a lot of different yeah. opportunities that are adding value to their lives and the lives of their communities. So we're going to back to Black Muse, right? Mm -hmm. But I was just thinking, this came out of my hand, like, like most kids, kids are creative, right? Or have created you ask that question. Like how many, how many times has creative been, have been killed in school where like a, teach, a kid asks a question and, and a teacher like, that question is stupid. That question makes no sense. Or like, be quiet and like just listen, right? That happens all the time. That happens all the time. That's a shame. Yes. And especially to, you know, black girls specifically and black boys where, you know, like we're seen as aggressive, we're seen as doing too much. Is and and we have a situation where the when we look at the demographics of the teachers are mostly white women. And that's great. But it's like they don't necessarily have experiences of working with black kids who are super curious. And so oftentimes they'll really get shut down. But of course, this is not just the race thing. This is happening all across the board. And that's why at Black Muse, we like literally. So, you did it again. <laughs> Give your props. <laughs> just ran me through Black Muse in there. No. Find a, find a connection. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> no. That's a co-founder right there. <laughs> no, it's literally like we. Be like, hey. Uh, what do you think about apples? Well, apples, I, I, we can do a metaverse section on black apples with black muse and blah, blah, blah. No, <laughs> I promise you, like, in creating black muse, we sat and we talked about the educational system. We sat and we talked about a lot of what we talked about and we use certain experiences that we've had. Um, so David, he has like so many different uses of experiences in teaching and I do too. Like I specialize in philosophy of education and we came together to create a different kind of educational environment. That's our main goal. And we're using the metaverse and these other tools like the VR headsets to do that. But our main goal is to create an environment where people's curiosity is satiated, where they have questions and they can explore those questions and they're not just shut down. Like that is the goal. And that's literally why we have um, in our, and I can show it to you, in our philosophy of education that we um, provide all of our instructors that teach um, at Black Muse, we say, hey, the goal is not to get them to do this or that thing. The goal is to have them to explore. And so even if they don't have the perfect understanding of how to code or how to do this or that, as long as they, the, the experience was exciting for them, and they were able to settle into being these curious beings um, who have questions like, 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 and, and, and really take ownership of that. Like that, we would say that you're, you're doing a good job that, that like, you, you're successful. So the next question, we kind of, next few questions, we kind of personal. Mm -hmm. So you and David became partners before Black Muse? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. and y'all decided to co-found this company, right? Um, well, I would say David was working with, um, doing this work, uh, okay. a couple of years before. Okay. Um, but he was doing it through the state. And so then when we came together, we started to create opportunities, um, um, outside of the state that are connected to the state. And so we're still going in to do, um, work with the state. So work with, um, DVR work with, um, students on IEP plans. Um, special education students um, like we had before, but the work that me and David are doing and that we've really created with Black Muse is mostly focused on, um, it's, it's doing like more public work. So being y'all in a relationship mm -hmm. and co-founders, has that made y'all relationship stronger, weaker? How's that worked out? Um, I would say definitely has made us stronger. I think, so David is like the first like like partner I've had that I've lived with and just like serious relationship, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I came here, moved here with him after being together, you know, for um, the time we have been together and it was different for me. And then also, you know, I'm telling you, you know, I'm coming to Washington where the trees are all large and shit. <laughs> and so it was just a lot going on. And then we're like doing all this work together. And um, David, I don't know if I should can say this. I don't know if he'd be upset with me saying this, but he has this thing of saying of like he's like really big about, you know, let's do the thing that's loving. And he's so loving and so caring and so nurturing, right? Um and uh from and and for him that means, you know, if we're talking about business, if we're talking about relationship stuff, anything. 
and he has the energy to be able to do it and the skills. I would say for me, um, because I hadn't been in a relationship and I felt like everything was like very foreign for me. It was like, okay, well, if we're going to be doing this and we're literally, like we said, for Black Muse, we have these goals of transforming the educational, I'm gonna, the educational system um, through this platform. I'm going to put everything I have into this. And so it was really difficult for me at first to kind of maintain that balance and it'd be like, okay, well, to kind of switch over for him. He can kind of like flirt and have a business meeting. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, we doing this, right? And so I think that was kind of difficult because I didn't want him to feel like, oh, he, you know, I'm not, I don't care, but I'm just like in that mindset. And then, and just kind of like having to learn to kind of be in a moment, have fun with it and all of that. And so I feel like I really learned that. And also I think that he learned a lot too, in terms of who I am, how to communicate effectively um, and all of that. And so I think through the process, even though it has been difficult um, or there have been certain difficulties, we've learned a lot. We've learned from that. We've made a decision. I think both of us individually not to fall back on, okay, well, I fucked up in this place. Maybe I didn't communicate or, you know, and maybe she felt, or he, he felt this type of way, you know, not to kind of go back, but to just learn from whatever our regrets are and to just every day is new. Every moment is new. And to just use the knowledge that we have um, from the difficult lessons um, in those moments and to just love each other and to have fun. So, and how many people on your team besides you and David? Um, there's two other people, okay. two other instructors. So like pose in the future, like pose you have like a 50 people in your company, right? How do you, how do you keep people like, like, how do I put this? Like the, how do you keep, how do you keep people have the perception of like you and David always have, how do I put this? Like, how do you keep people like playing like mom versus dad? How do you keep people from like, you know, like, okay, no matter what David is going to support, you know, Taylor, Dave Taylor support David. Like how do you like, keep the perception away? Like, how do you keep people like hey, how do you make people like believe, okay, if I go to David, he disagrees with me, I can go to Taylor. And even though Taylor's married to David, Taylor's like, okay, you know what? You're actually right. Let me go tell David, you're, David, you're wrong. This employee's right. How do you work through that? I feel like this would be a question that David would be really great at answering. Um, <laughs> I would say I haven't thought too much about this. Um, and I would also say that for me it is something that I know I want to think about more because in my classrooms, people can kind of see me as a mom. And I don't know if that's just me being a black woman and, and being called socialized in a certain type of way to kind of give certain things and have people. But um, I, I, that has been a problem for me because it takes a lot of energy. And so I'm really committed to, under, to, to understanding and having my students understand, hey, I'm not your mom. You know, I'm here to help you and equip you with these skills, but I'm not your mom. And so if there is any kind of dynamic of a mom, dad thing, you know, I don't want it. I don't, you know, I don't even, I don't want, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you have your own parents, you know? So I definitely want to work with David to think about how we can create a different kind of atmosphere. I think in general, just because of gender dynamics and how people see them, how people see gender people may impose that onto us. Um, but regardless, I think we can, there, there, there may be certain things that, I mean, we can just be who we are and do what we're doing and, and do some, do things that transforms and that transcends that. Um, so that, that wouldn't, so that regardless of what people think, they'll have to learn, okay, well, this is what is, this is what, what's going on. And so, um, Taylor really can come to me or David really can come to me. And in that, me and David are very different. So I think that, I mean, for David, Black News is his baby, you know? And so somebody come with a good idea. He's going to be like, okay, Taylor, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's, not my, that's, that, that's not my vision. Yeah, he will say that. He will say that. Um, and I, for me, I'm really big about values, especially when it comes to rounding the educational spaces on love and belonging and all that. And so if anybody comes to me about that and David is somewhere else that I'm going to be like, okay, let's, you know, uh, we need more meetings. He hates meetings, but, <laughs> but we're, we're going to have to have another meeting. <laughs> yeah. I'm the same way. I hate meetings too. So how do you and David like break down, like not on like big picture things, like, you know, like, like who does marketing, who does sales, who does like engineering, like how do you also break down the day-to-day -day tasks? 
Oh, well, he does like most of the developing stuff. And then I create the meet. I set up, <laughs> I set up meetings. I like create the, uh, make sure that I do uh, admin work, uh, make sure that things just but kind of like doing like more like project management stuff with people. Um, and then um, making sure that people like our instructors understand um, how to create loving atmospheres in the classroom. That's kind of like what I'm doing. But he, um, you know, has created the curriculum and he does the development side of things. Yeah. So what's like, what's the business model? Like how y'all make money? How do we make money? So God, uh, and <laughs> um, I think no, but uh, no, but for all, yeah, I mean, yes. Um, I really felt like we've just been really blessed. A lot of stuff has like that we've done has literally kind of been like how we talked about with Metro Park. Um, it hasn't even been people asking, um, doing like extensive interviews with us or anything like that. A lot of what we've been able to secure, like in terms of contracts, has been it's almost like dropped into our laps, you know, people just kind of see the work and they're like, okay, I want to work with you. Um, and so I think that it's been God in that way. Um, but in terms of just like our, st our strategy for it, going to conferences. So we went to the um, HBC conference, HBCU conference. At, um, actually it was for HBCUs and minority serving institutions for quantum literacy. And we went to that um, conference, that workshop, and we made a lot of different contacts so, and positioned ourselves to do work with them um, and also just reaching out to different universities and other businesses that, um, that we network with to see if maybe they want to build, have us build a world or a product um, for the metaverse. What, what's quantum literacy? You said that several times. What's quantum literacy? Okay, so um, in the field of like, you know, like quantum physics, quantum computing, um, like people need to be like literate about it um, okay. so that they can like develop certain skills to, yeah. So common sense, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so for Black Muse, who pays for it? Who pays for it? Yeah, like is it the, like, does Metro Parks pay for it? Does mm -hmm. like individual students pay for it? Do the parents pay for it? Like who who's pays the money for it? It depends on what the contract looks like. Okay. So uh, at Metro Parks, um, we get, you know, invoiced by Metro Parks. Um, we are working doing the Roblox Academy at CNC. Um, it's an organization, a nonprofit organization in Kent. Yeah. Um, and so the parents pay for that okay. individually, but then also there are scholarships. And so the CNC um, works to help with the scholarships. Um, you know, juvenile rehabilitation, you know, the state pays for it. Um, DVR, let's enter into different contracts with DVR, the state will pay for it. So it just depends on the contract. Um, yeah. Okay. So quick side note, like we're going to talk about the power networking, right? So back in July 25th, I did a pitch competition, right? Which, you know, Black Muse took part in, right? One of the judges was Aubrey Schenholster, who was like the board of director of CNC. CNC. Yeah. Who like, and like, you know, it's, it's funny how things work out, right? Yes. That's what I'm saying. God. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm good. That's like I'm glad like that, that good relationship like, that worked out right. Yeah, so I go to the pit company like this one one company did like approve some kind of get, get someone got a job, someone got a customer right. That's the only thing that matters, right? Yes, yes. I will say like that was been one of the best experiences for yeah. us. Um, it came at a time where you know we were um had certain opportunities, waiting for certain opportunities to come through, and just kind of like okay, well where are we at with things? And so it was just like really great to be rewarded for work, work that we have done. And then to make those connections there was so amazing. Um, just the, but then just the whole experience, you know, I think of try, just putting together our pitch yeah. um, and doing it and seeing other people's pitches and just, you know, yeah. and that's, it's kind of nerve wracking, but then it kind of shows you kind of some pointers of, yeah. you know, how we should be doing things, marketing strategy, where we should, how we should go about doing things. So it was just a really, really phenomenal, amazing experience. So it was, it was so funny, right? So they, they announced a win and they advanced like y'all won the community award, right? So Karina announced the community award. They was clapping like they sat back down. Like they even come up here. Like y'all come up here and catch, you know, it was so funny, like, you know, community award, community, you know, Black Muse, they were like, step back down. 
Yeah. 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 He's so cute. (laughs) (laughs) So for Black Muse, who is y'all like perfect customer? A perfect customer. I would say a school that has internet access. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's pretty key, right? That's pretty key, right? That's yes. pretty key. And students who um, who who are have a uh, who have certain needs that we can address, um, and that want to do the kind of work, and they're interested in doing that kind of work. They and and we can like you know engage with them because of where they're at. I would say. So you're in the Saturday right now, validating yeah. everything. What's the growth like? Are you going to go to Houston, Texas next? Denver, Colorado next? What, what, like, what's the growth plan? Right. Yeah. So right now we're working to get contracts um, in Texas and California. Um, and so that should be coming off really, really soon. And so um, if we get those state, that would be more like state-based contracts. We're going to try and um, do that route first because I think it will set us up to do more public work mm-hmm. later. Um, but if we can get um, contract um, through the state to work with the schools um, and, you know, the state will be paying the uh, us to do this work um, and creating the space so the students could um, experience high quality education. Um, I think that that would be really great. Um, and so we're going to work to get these different state contracts and then hopefully work to go public there, too. Um, and. Yeah, that's that's where we're at. Is there a plan to go to like a rural America, like farm America? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think they're so overlooked, right? Huh? I think over, I think I, I, rural America overlooked America, like farm America, country America, so overlooked as far as tech. You know? Yes, that's my and and I, that's my dream. I mean, I say that's our dream. That's our dream. Um. Ah, <laughs> uh, but yes, I think like bringing quantum um literacy um job or is quantum jobs um to um certain rural areas um where they can make money tech jobs where they can make money um this is like a booming industry an evolving industry and so um bringing those type of jobs to those areas um and having them create you know whatever it is that they create that you know i'm sure will transform the world i think that that would be super super dope and and during the process even providing certain opportunities to make things like VR headsets. Um, that would be, that's, that's a goal for us. That is our goal. We want to be able to add value to people um, and as much value as we can to people's lives um, and looking at different demographics, um, different underserved communities. Um, so it could be black people. It could mean, you know, women, it could mean, you know, um, um, poor folk and, and also people in rural areas. We want to, um, be for people who have been previously underserved, and that includes people in rural areas. That's definitely one of our goals. Is there such a thing as a headset for someone who's blind? So David worked with a blind student um, um, using the VR headset. You can talk to him more about it because I'm not exactly sure about the, the details, but I know that from that experience, um, he began to think about curriculum of how to do it. And he was saying that there is ways to design worlds. So you can have a headset, you know, so it wouldn't necessarily be a different kind of headset, I don't think. Um, and maybe you can make certain type of changes to it to make it more accessible for people, but you can have like a regular headset and then design the world in the way so that um, it's, it's, it's accessible for them. Yeah. So this is going to be a fucked up question, but like our headsets, like one size fit all, a headset like based on your head size, like head size, something like how does that work? So um, whenever you get the headset, I wish I had um, a headset here, but whenever you get the headset, um, you put like, you, it's uh, you, like, there'll be like a little strap and so you can modify it. Okay. Um, you can also, so no, matter big, no matter how big your head is, you get a headset. <laughs> yes. And also if you have glasses, you know, there'll be uh, like a, it's just like a little thing that you can put on to put your glasses in. Um, if you are someone who gets like motion sickness a lot, there's a feature so that it can kind of like stop the motion sickness. And so, yeah, there's different features that you can use to modify it. But of course, you're coming out with like different headsets um, to kind of, you know, make things better um, for people. So it's not like everything right now is perfect. Um, but yeah, like if you have a big head or if you have a small <laughs> head, you should be OK. And like who like who makes y'all's headsets like like where are you getting from? Like they're from, like from Facebook, like, like the VR Quest or like. 
Yeah, MetaQuest 2. We get okay. MetaQuest 2. MetaQuest 2, okay. Who else makes headsets? That's because that's, that's Facebook based, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people, um, there's different. So, I mean, like, you can outsource he- headsets outside of the country mm-hmm. um, and get them very cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, and some educational institutions do that, but those headsets may be a little different in terms of what you can do yeah. and like how you, and like, 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 so with the MetaQuest 2, we're accessing the world. Okay. Um, and you can, and like, you literally feel like you're in that world. Um, but with other headsets, maybe it's this thing where you kind of can look around in the world, but you can't walk around. You can't feel like if you're, you can't actually go rock climb, like, okay. you know, and so, um, I would say that there are different headsets, Apple's making, you know, their own headset, um, where, um, you can do different things. And so there's different companies, um, who are creating headsets that allow you to do different things. What's the risk of someone getting so immersed in VR metaverse that they lose sense of reality? Like a really big risk. Like, I mean, I will say virtual reality is reality. Uh, so if you go into the world and you have like a little kid, like I did yesterday, walking around, following me around. Oh, girl, you ugly. You know, like little kids do because they're weird. Um, Cause you know, like if it goes like, a, I went into like a random like a classroom um and it wasn't our classroom um and then you know little kids are like in fifth grade and they like bully each other and all that sort of stuff um but yeah so like it, it I, I would say like if you go into a space and um you walk around and you get pulled in and you get put into it and you interact with people in that space it could be harmful to you and the harm that you engender that is real that is reality. And so I wouldn't say that that's not reality, but definitely you can be on there for long tracts of time and get and, and forget about the, the, the physical world. Right. And that can be very detrimental and it can be very easy to do that in the same way as it can be very easy to just sit up there and watch reels all day on your phone. Wasn't there a case where like in the metaverse, like this male character, like great or female character, I want, I, want, I want to see that happen, that. right? So if, if that happens, like, is that is something like can be done legally or lawfully? Like, can they arrest that person? I mean, it's in the metaverse, like, like what's the law like for that? Like, it's sexual harassment or any kind of thing like that. You know, I'm sure it happens. Yeah, right? yeah, definitely. Like, what recourse do people have? So I know that there are ways, lots of what you can block people, make it to where you don't see them, or um, you like they can't access you mm-hmm. anymore. Um, and it's really easy to do that mm-hmm. on the uh, MetaQuest 2 headsets. Um, and and, and out, certain worlds have their own rules about these things. Um, and so, and it will make it easier or harder to harass people or not. Um, but in general, the metaverse is super new, you know? And yeah. so how to deal with these things on a legal standpoint, that's what people are right now developing. Um, and I think that's why David always says that the technology is growing faster than us, is growing faster than our government and all of those things, because, of, you know, a lot of our government, they may not even know about the meta, you know, and, and how to. And so they don't even know the, the how to navigate that or the how to create laws. And so and right now there is situations in, that are calling them to deal with it. But. So, it's not like we just have stuff in place right now. Can you imagine this? You remember like, like a few months ago, they had like these, these hearings on Congress by TikTok, right? All the congressmen asked these dumbass questions, right? Like ridiculous questions, right? Yeah. I mean, like, dude, ask your freaking intern, right? Can you imagine they did like a, 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 a congressional hearing on, on the metaverse? All the stupid questions be, you were asked? Yeah. It would, yeah. Uh, it would so, be insanely yeah. stupid. Yeah. So I think that is an issue of like, how do we deal with issues around sexual harassment and all of these different race, uh, gen- religion, all of these different things in the metaverse? And how do we enforce these rules? Um, and then there's issues around privacy and identity and people stealing people's identity in the metaverse. Um, and so, I mean, there's there's a lot of, of, of things that people are right now working to try and address. So I've been interested in like the stats on this, right? And it probably don't exist, right? Like, of course, most people in the metaverse, they're going to, like, you know, re, re, like, you know, like, like emoji, right? you like, white guy, black person, you like, you make yourself look the same. But how many people in the metaverse, like, you know, I'm a black guy, 
I'm gonna make myself a white person, right? I want to see how what's it like to live like a white person or vice versa, right? Yeah, like people to, do that a lot. I can see the stuff. I think that would be more. Yeah, I think that would be really interesting because I think people do that even like just like in video games and stuff. Like sometimes, uh, you know, you may want to be a cute little girl because you don't want to go through this whole video game looking at this like big old bunk of you know man or yeah. whatever. And and then there'll be guys who will follow the girl around, you know, but it was a guy around thinking they're a girl, you know, you gotta yeah. so I think that is um yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I don't know about this idea of um because your avatar is black or a woman or a trans person, you know what it's like, yeah. you know. <laughs> or maybe it's more and, like and, and, maybe it's more like, you know, you have to learn what people treat you like, you know. I don't know about that either. No. Because the funny thing about the metaverse is that I think a lot of rules of engagement just change in general. Like um, David was teaching this one lawyer a couple of weeks back, black woman, um, you know, how the metaverse works and all of this stuff. And she went into the metaverse and she just started playing and doing like weird shit, you know, funny stuff, right? Because uh, she's just exploring. Mm -hmm. And she wouldn't do that in a like a uh, regular environment, you know? Well, well hopefully not, right? <laughs> right. Right. But she was just exploring, yeah. you know? And and you can and it's 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 very interesting because you know you go into the you go into the world or you know and go into like say you have a matter quest two has headset and then you just go to, um you have an option as soon as you um um turn it on to go to horizon world and this is where you can access all of the worlds right and you can go in any world you want to and there'll be someone from any place in around the world. And it's kind of just the idea of that. Like, I'm just in this world with somebody from Australia or somewhere. Yeah. And, and but then also at the same time, navigating, okay, well, um, this is how my body feels like. This is how it feels to navigate this space or to do this. And you can just walk up, you know? And so I think because it's so interesting and new, people may not even act the way that they normally would um, or even think to do that. Maybe they want, they may be more intuitive to act like their avatar or something like that, you know, or to just do funny stuff, you know? And so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not the, the idea that you would have the similar experience, um, in terms of race or gender or religion, culture is interesting. Cause it's so, it's, it's very different. I will say you will have very similar, I mean, you, you may get racial slurs thrown at you. You may get um, people saying very sexist comments to you um, if you your avatar is feminine or masculine, you know, or whatever it is. Um, or say, you know, you're, you, um, your avatar is, you dress, you have like certain like, uh, I don't know, Muslim headdress or something like that, like a hijab or something like that. Like maybe people will make comments, but I'm not sure. I think that's a really interesting philosophical question of if that would map on to the actual Muslim experience or the black experience or the white man's experience. I don't know if I put on a, I had created a white man avatar and I walked around in the world like a white man, like if I really would know how it is to be a white man. Without that socialization, there's a lot of, you know, fuck shit that white men have to deal with that we don't talk about in society. And just because maybe somebody says, fuck you, white man, fuck you, pig, in the metaverse world, you know, because of certain things that are going on in the society, I don't know if I would feel what it's like to be a white man. So, like, if you're on Twitter, Instagram, there's a lot of trolls out there, right? You Like, you know, you feel like, you know, your, your Twitter name's at BigButt21, right? You're talking about a lot of bullshit, right? In the metaverse, you have to like use your real name. You can be anonymous as well. You can be anonymous. Yeah, I wish there was a way to change that. Really? Yeah, I mean, like, so people can be accountable. Accountable. Now, maybe like, maybe you don't put your real name, but like, be like, you know, like, post like your username is like, you know, at Buffalo Chase Twenty One, right? And you and you go online, you say, you know, you like you bully someone, do something right. Someone should be able to go and 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 trace who you are, right? I think like if you report it, you could, but just like on your username, people yeah. wouldn't know. Yeah. Like I have, um, I was talking to a coworker at this, uh, um, there's this one like job event I worked at and they were saying they are a pirate in this one world. Mm 
and and they have and they you know they have AI so they have an Australian accent and so they just think that but everybody who thinks meets them they think that they have they're from Australia or something like that and they're just like this white guy he's just this white guy from Washington you know and so uh, if he says things or do things people wouldn't know they would assume that he's like somebody different unless he claims to be himself um, but if they reported him then there would be, you know, that he could literally get in trouble, like if he was reported for doing something. Yeah, I just think too many people on social media, like I call it like social media courage, right? So many people put posts online that would never dare say to someone's face, right? Right. They would never dare say to someone's face at all. And I think it's, it would be, that may be kind of also an issue in the metaverse because you, you're just like in this different, like, you're just yeah. like in this fantasy land. And so you just like, okay. Um, but I, I do think a lot of people, um, the more that they learn and they teach, you know, we teach people about how to engage in these spaces and that you have a responsibility for your avatar. Your avatar is a representation of who you are. I think the less that that will happen. And I think that's why not to plug in, uh, black muse, um, uh, that is why, <laughs> <Once again. laughs> yeah, that's why we, we, we spend like a whole module teaching our students that and helping our students understand how to engage with people who may not get it. Is there a minimum age to use your platform? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, I'm pretty sure if you are, um, under the age of eight, you can't use it. Okay. Why eight? That's just the metaverse. That's just like a legal thing. Is it? Okay. Okay. So what's the age group of people using your, your platform now? 8 to 25, 8 to 20, 8 to 18? Um, I would say 8 to 25 is generally like the age range of our students. Okay. Um, well, so we have an um, elementary um, um, program. And so... And but those are like mostly you know the older kids mm -hmm. joining, and then uh, middle school, and high school, and then we have through the J, um, R the juvenile rehabilitation is eighteen to twenty five. Do you find that a certain age or age range um, is best suited to use your platform? Mm -mm. Okay. No. Do people have to be like like I won't say like tech experts have to be like they have to be like kind of like kind of tech um, tech tech enabled savvy. tech no. savvy or tech savvy no. Mm -mm. We teach friendly. them that. Okay. Yeah, we teach them like how to. That's that's the course. Is like teaching them like how to navigate these spaces and how to build in these spaces. And so, um, if they don't know anything, that's fine because you know that's what we're here for. So anyone can learn it. Yeah. Regardless of education level. Yeah. Uh, abilities, whatever. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, speaking about that, I would love, um, uh, somewhere down the line, really to work with older populations with this. Um, I think that would be super, super awesome. Um, I think um, whenever we get the opportunity to begin to teach in prisons um, more, and a lot of them, you know, it's very difficult to you know, even understand like certain things about a laptop. Um, I think we'll have more of an opportunity to do that work. Um, but yeah, I want to, I want to work with different populations. I've been able it's for all population. How does a program work? Like, for example, like, pose. There's a grandmother in a nursing home, like eighty years old. Yeah. Is there a way to do a program where this eighty year old grandmother can bake a cake with their like thirteen year old granddaughter? That, yes, that's the lovely thing about the metaverse, is that no matter where you are, you can just hop on into the world, and you can like go into a world where it's like a kitchen, and the grandma teaches the little grand her grandchild how to create. Uh, 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 how to, yeah, how to make a cake or something like that, you know? Um, so it's literally for that. That's the beautiful thing about the metaverse. Um, and so, you know, say there's a, the pandemic, it worsens, people have to go home again. It would be really great if they could take advantage of, um, you know, the metaverse and get some VR headsets if it's affordable to them, because it won't just be like going on Zoom. It'll be like I'm like people can going into if they were cut to come into this room and sit with us, yeah. right? And do things with us. Design we can design a whole, you know, Jason Cavanaugh's world where it's literally based on like this actual room and they can feel like what it's like to be in this actual room with us. Um and so yeah, it's it's, it's perfect for that. And y'all are based out of, out of Tacoma, Washington? Yes. And so y'all like uh, y'all meet in person. How's like day to day operation like? Y'all meet in person. Y'all fully remote. How's that work? Um. So we 
meet in the schools um, and we teach in the schools. And so we kind of have like a hybrid thing going, going where um, we teach material. Um, so maybe teach how to coding, teach um, coding, 3D modeling, programming, stuff like that. And then have the students um, try it out, learn it in the metaverse, and then kind of do a black and back and forth. Um, we do group discussions, do um, like writing reflections um, outside of the metaverse. Um, and so we kind of have like a hybrid thing going on in the schools. But when it comes to like just doing like stuff for business, um, you know, do meetings in the metaverse and stuff like that. So is the, is the plan in the future, like, you know, like, you know, have like um, Black Muse, like schools everywhere? Is it have like the like headset factories everywhere? Like what's the big term vision of it? Definitely. I think when it comes to the metaverse, our dream, our ultimate goal is to use it to democratize education and to create opportunities for people. And, and so, yeah, our dream, our goal is to help use the tool to do that. And so we want to have it everywhere. We want to get it everywhere. And so that people everywhere, regardless of their background, um, ethnicity, culture, uh, you know, um, how much money they make, how much money their their families make, that they can use a tool to be able to create something, build something where they can mon that they can monetize um, and use to provide for themselves, their family, and their community. Um, and we are particularly committed to working with underserved communities to do this work. And so, like you said, that means working with people in rural towns, um, working with people in urban areas, uh, working with all sorts of underserved communities everywhere um, to be able to get access to the resource so that they can build things with it and monetize with it. Um, and if that means, you know, in addition to this, manufacturing our own headsets to make it affordable and more accessible to people, then that's definitely what we'll do. Talk about the pros and cons of being an entrepreneur. Pros and cons of being an entrepreneur. Well, working a lot is definitely a con. <laughs> um, I would say, yeah, just, I mean, but really, I don't, I don't think it, it I, I'm not, this is something that I have, a, you could tell me, because I'm thinking if I develop a really great work-life balance, then, you know, I'm okay. At this time, I'm work and at this time, I'm gonna play. At this time, I'm gonna do this. I'm thinking that I won't, it won't be so bad, you know? Do you feel like that's true? Yeah, I mean, I might think like, like you said, there's no like work life balance. That's like, that's a life, right? Like, for example, like, you know, I'm, I, have a, I have a startup, I'm doing like grind or whatever, right? And so back in April, I have a good friend, Kevin, right? He said, hey, uh, his, he's from Laos, his wife from Vietnam, and she's a program in Highland College, the supply manager, right? And the program was actually go to Vietnam for 10 days. Hey, Jason, you know, I'm gonna take 10 days off, right? My wife's gonna be this program. Come go to Vietnam with me, right? And Mark's like, I'm not gonna go to fucking Vietnam. <laughs> like, get the fuck out of here, right? Yeah. Like, it's not, it's not nowhere about the top country to go to visit, right? Right. But then, like, you know, I have a, I, I'm doing a fundraiser, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, right? I'm like, then it's like, light bulb went Jason, when you get a chance to go to, to Vietnam, where you have like basic tour guide, right? Mm -hmm. And so I went, right? Of course, I still do work, still do meetings, right? I just think you still got to do things like, like that, right? You know, like, every once I have, like, a beer with some friends, you know. I'll probably go to Texas next month for a couple, couple of days, right? I mean, you got you to gotta have some kind of balance, right? Now, there are times you got to, like, you know, like, work, like, 14-hour day, seven days in a row, like, just grind it or whatever. Yeah, of course. But you still, you got you to find opportunities to take breaks, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think if I play my cards right, hopefully I'll be able to do that. Maybe I can take trips mm -hmm. or at least I can take, like, a – like my goal is to have every day be the weekend yeah, and just have a thing, a life where my whole life is the weekend where maybe I work a little bit, but it's time so well that it's like, I get to play a lot, yeah. you know, that would be really nice. So maybe I'm not taking like this trip to Vietnam, but I'm taking like, you know, a, a walk to the park or something, yeah. you know, I just, or maybe yeah. catching the boat of Bamers Island or Victoria, you know, Canada or, you know, yeah, that'd be the dream. Or take a hike, you know, maybe I went to a good time to be an entrepreneur. Like you, you can go to Mountain Renew on Tuesday at 1 p.m. and take a hike, right? If you it's, want to. Yeah. If you're working for like, you know, Boeing, that shit ain't happening. Right. You know, you got to be there. Even, even remote, 
just can't randomly take off, right? You gotta be yeah. tied to your computer, right? Yeah, and I mean, you can be like, you can schedule it, be like, okay, I'm not taking meetings at this time, so you can block your calendar, right? Yes, yes. Look, on calendar, look, it's not. Yeah, so I think that's it's possible. I'm just learning how to do it. So, so I think one of the important things that an entrepreneur is to say no to people, right? How do you how do you know when the right time to say no to people are is? Talk to David. <laughs> He'll normally tell me beforehand. <laughs> be like if anybody says it, say no. <laughs> um, but um, I would say listen to my spirit. Really, um, be open and 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 I think I'm just learning in general in my life um, that a lot of times I feel like compelled to do everything and all of that but that I can take my time with things and it's better to take my time for things. And if something is really meant for me, then it'll happen. Um, and so I don't need to be like, I have to do this because if it's really meant for me, then it will be for me. And if I'm doing all of these different things and I'm saying yes to everything, then that will be less time for myself. And if I'm burnt out, I can't really connect to David and I can't really connect to other things that really matter people that really matter to me and so I'm just learning that there's like a grave consequence if I say yes to everything so I have to say no and so just having the mindset of being like okay well when I'm here or I'm doing this I'm gonna have to say no because I want to maintain these other things um other relationships that really matter to me so are you and David like always on, so to speak, or is like, you have an agreement like, okay, like every, every day we eat dinner from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. There's no work talk. Or is like always work, work, work. I feel like with him, he has a lot of energy. <laughs> so for him, I think he's more, well, actually, no, this is what I'll say. I think I'm, it's kind of difficult to answer the question because I think we both have different times where we're on. I think when I'm waking up and I'm doing, I'm ready. And then I- You come out of the bed, like, let's go. You, I, well, not like immediately, but like generally I'm ready to talk. He may not necessarily be ready. Maybe he wants to develop or play a game. Then I feel like at night, I feel like if, if there may be a time where I'm like, okay, well, we're wrapping up. This is what I did. I want to talk to you about, you know, this is, can, you know, can we do this? What do you think about this? And at night, he's kind of ready to wind down. And so there's certain times where he is really energetic <laughs> and he's ready. And there are certain times where, I, and those times I feel like I may not be. And I, but it, it's, it's like this weird situation where when I'm not, maybe he is. And when he is, I'm not. And that creates this thing where it's like, like all the time, or you because know, <laughs> we're always, and so we are working on getting to a place where we are like okay at this time we'll do this or at this time I think in general David is just like super committed to being responsive to me and so he's just like okay well I guess whenever she says something and he's kind of like learning okay if he has to maintain a certain type of <laughs> wellness for himself <laughs> he can't be and he has to say no and so that means that he's gonna we just gotta work out schedules so all that is to say, I'm just, just talking as I'm working out. We got to figure some stuff out. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's uh, you and David, and you have two people. Are those two people employees or contractors? What are they? Employees. Employees, okay. So what type of culture do y'all want to have at Black Muse? Um, Just kind of like we're talking about before in terms of adding value, where there's like always like value added to the... um. Um, whoever it is that we're partnering with and working with. Um, and so value in terms of them getting paid well, we really are working our best to position them to make sure that they get paid for the work that they're doing. Um, I think that we do that now, but getting more, get, you know, um, offering more um, because our employees are really just awesome. Um, and also um, adding value in terms of opportunities so development jobs, develop, um, um, jobs like in, you know, um, on the development team um, so that they can have more opportunities, build up their portfolio um, even more. 
Um, and and also, um, I want to we want to be able to get to a situation because not me. It's, this is David's idea um, where our students are creating lucrative products that are very generative um, and that, you know, that they can make a lot of money off of. And so having our um, the people that we partner with, um, the instructors, if they want to invest in that, help them with that, you know, add value to their lives in that. Um, just thinking, we're just really trying to think of different ways to add value. And so in creating a culture where the everybody who works with us understands that their value, that they're valued, and that um, we understand how valuable they are to us, um, and that they matter, and that the work that they do, that they do matters. Um, and so they're always getting some sort of return back and they understand like that, that that's the type of relationship it is. Um, so yeah, like having a, a culture where, yeah, um, kind of like my classrooms where everybody, everyone is valuable and no one is disposable and everyone is, is grounded in an understanding of that. And then um, where people can create and be creative in the classroom, but then also on the development team. So Let's suppose someone uses your platform, they start a business mm -hmm. and they make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Is it, do y'all get a percentage of that? Or is like this, all, uh, all the money goes to them? I mean, it, it would depend on the setup. So if a business comes to us and they want to create um, and say, um, maybe they don't necessarily have the funds up front to really invest in creating a world for the metaverse. And we work to develop the stuff for them. Um, then at the point where now we are getting into sales, we may say, Hey, I want like 5% or 10% of whatever this is, because I was like, you know, helping to produce this product. Um, but generally when it comes to our students, um, the goal is to ensure again, that value is adding, added to their life and as much value as we can. And so we're not going to be, you know, like taking from them, we're going to we're really working to position our students in a place where they have ownership of whatever it is that they have. And they also know their rights and, and, and when it comes to trademarks, intellectual property, all of that, and, and it's theirs and, and that they can profit off of it. Yeah. So can you go more detail, like how black Muse got started, what you focus on now, what the future vision is for black Muse? Yeah. Um, so, um, it got started after the metaverse came out. I think it was like maybe a couple months or so. David created uh, the curriculum and stuff for it, but he was doing that with the state and partnering with um, a nonprofit to do that work. Um, and so, and in that, and he was doing a lot of that work through like the yeah through the state. So partnering. Um, with different institutions to teach students on IEP plans, how to build and monetize on the metaverse. Then um, in the last few months, um, we worked to make it public um, and to get this into the schools um, for all sorts of students and get it into other institutions like um, JR. Um, and then also provide training solutions for businesses. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of like the evolution of Black Muse. Um, and in terms of where we're going, um, really just trying our best to bring this nationwide, create a situation where all students, all and especially particularly under deserved, under, um, underserved communities, um, that they have the opportunities to use the tool that is the metaverse, the use of VR headsets to ensure that education really is the great equalizer so that, you know, they really do get educational opportunities that allow them to um, not just mobilize within the system, but to create new systems and to create um, new opportunities for themselves. Taylor, is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Um... No, I don't think, I don't, I don't know. I feel like we talk about a lot. I want to hear more about you, though. I want to hear more about you. Okay. Yeah, and I want to, like, I want us to play on the headset. Okay. Yeah, I feel like we should all get together and play on the headset. I think that would be really fun. Probably. Yeah. 
are because are you like a do you like like playing like video games and stuff? Not as much as I did in the past, but yeah, I still get like yeah. Okay, okay. The video games in the world, like they're crazy. Mm-hmm. I feel like we could have we could have fun. Mm-hmm. I really do. So yeah, I think yeah, and just learning because I feel like there's so many questions about me. I really want to learn more about you. So okay. yeah. Nice. Um, can you give us your social media links for you and your company so people can reach out to you? Um yeah. Um, well, we have a page on Facebook. Um, but if you want to reach out to us, maybe uh, email us uh, at client services at blackmuse.net. Um, client services at blackmuse.net. Um, and then um, call us. Um, you know, we'll just, we're happy to answer any questions um, or concerns that you have about the metaverse, or maybe you want to learn how to code or build stuff on it, learn how to monetize it. Maybe you want training solutions for your business um metaverse training solutions for your business we will be here to we would love to help you love to serve you um and you can call us for more information at 832-253-2379 um it's 832-253-2379 and y'all have an actual office y'all go to work every day or Uh, we work in the school so we don't have like a yeah okay so like where do you store your stuff at like all the headsets at like your house or the each instructor has um the headsets and then they're okay. yeah and they they just bring them to the school they have like a, a set of so how many headsets y'all have like on hand so to speak um right now 12 12 okay mm-hmm. yeah and how y'all get what's the plan to get more you have to buy them rent them how's that work yeah i'm so, sure they're, sure they're not cheap yes yeah there's 300 um for each headset um for the meta quest um two headset so isn't the apple one's gonna be like fucking twenty five thousand dollars some craziness like that yeah, that's with the a um the AR. So you are you won't just be able to access stuff in the headset. It'll be like in the world, like the you know the the like you'll be able to do something um and see things outside of it. Um, so that's why it costs so much, and and we're not gonna have that for the students. Um, until maybe we start manufacturing <laughs> our own, because that's a lot um of money for those. So yeah. So before we get out of here, can you give us any last minute wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Um, any advice? I don't know. Uh, um, no, I, I guess I will say, um, yeah, I mean, if you or anyone you know wants to learn about the metaverse, how to build, contact us. Um, we are for creating transformative educational spaces that are grounded in love um, and where people experience belonging um, and where people can add value to their lives and, and use, you know, this technology to add value to their lives. So definitely, definitely reach out to us um, and yeah, follow us and yeah, we'll see where it goes. Taylor, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. And so, listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. No. Oh. <laughs>